Uh, I'd like to call the City of Norco City Council uh, regular meeting to order. Will the clerk please do the roll call? Thank you. Mayor Newton? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hoffman? Yes. Council Members Bash? Yes. Grunmeyer? Yes. And Hannah? Yes. All present. Thank you. We need to uh, add by urgency a second item to the closed session, the conference with legal counsel and anticipated litigation. Can I entertain a motion? Second. Thank you. We have a motion from Council Member Bash and a motion from Council Member Hanna. Roll call. Mayor Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hoffman? Yes. Council Members Bash? Yes. Grunmeyer? Yes. And Hannah? Yes. Thank you. Motion passed. Thank you. Uh, uh, are there any cards from any members of the audience? No, sir. We They're all sitting very quietly. We will adjourn to closed session. <laughs> Good evening. I'd uh, like the city attorney to. Uh, uh, report from our closed session. Yes, uh, although, there are no, uh, although there are literally no reportable actions, uh, one of the discussions which occurred in the closed session was uh, threat of litigation uh, on behalf of the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project, alleging that the at large voting process in the city of Norco may be a violation of the California Voting Rights Act, and requesting that the district that the city uh, voluntarily change to uh, district voting rather than at large voting and access to the legal implications. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to ask uh, all of us first uh, to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance by Councilmember Bash and then remain standing for the invocation by Pastor Robert on SECA. And if you would, uh, before Councilman Bash starts the pledge, that we have a moment of silence for the uh, Las Vegas victims. so much for this great city. Uh, we thank you for your face uh, shining upon it. We ask for your divine protection to be over it and ask that you would continue to bless all the plans and the thoughts and, and activities, uh, Lord, that go into making this city so great. I pray this evening, Lord, that you would give a discernment and knowledge to the council members as they uh, take into the consideration all the things that we will be brought up tonight. And we thank you for their service, Lord God, and ask that you would uh, continue to protect them and keep them. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, so we have a pro pro proclamation for uh, Red Ribbon Week, and I'd like uh, Robin Jones and Paulo Marino come up front and I'd like uh, all of council uh, to join us down there and two of our council members uh, Robin Grunmeyer and Kevin Basher are on our unload committee which participate with this group
It's my pleasure on behalf of City Council to read the proclamation for you guys. Whereas cities across America have been plagued by numerous problems associated with alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use, and whereas the red ribbon was chosen as a symbol commemorating the work of DEA Enrique Kiki Camarena, who was murdered in 1985 in the line of duty, and has come to represent his belief that one person can make a difference, and whereas the 2017 Red Ribbon Week theme, Your Future is Key, So Stay Drug Free, promotes family and individual responsibilities for living healthy, drug-free lifestyles without illegal drugs or the illegal use of legal drugs, and whereas the Corona Norco Unified School District further commits its support and resources to ensure the success of Red Ribbon Week and year-round alcohol, tobacco, and other drug abuse prevention efforts, we hereby, uh, on behalf of all the City Council, do hereby proclaim October 23rd through the 31st of 2017 be designated as Red Ribbon Week. So some of the things, so thank you for the proclamation. Thank you very much, thank you so much. Um, out front, I left a red flyer, that is the contest flyer. We have a poster creative writing contest. Last year, three of our um, students won, and they will be featured their posters in the calendar. That's coming out shortly. Um, we have a recognition evening for them. And um, also to end the, uh, the events in October, we have a Family Fun Festival, October 29th at Promenade Park, uh, off of McKinley, 12 to 4. We invite all of you to come out. It's just a fun, a fun day for the families. So thank you. If you have any questions on the red flyer on Robin, my name and phone number um, is on there. You can be in touch if you have any questions about Red Ribbon. Thank you. to uh, City Council Communications, reports on regional boards and commissions. I'm just going to change this up a little bit. Um, this past weekend, uh, all of City Council and City Manager attended our uh, Norco Citizens on Patrol uh, annual banquet. And I would like our uh, Police Chief, Lieutenant Brigham, just to say a few words in regard to that. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, and thank you, members of City Council. It's always my pleasure to talk about our Norco Citizens Patrol folks. They have been with us for a long time, and when we talk about the history, it goes back two decades. In fact, this banquet that we had for them to honor their service to the city of Norco was the 22nd year. So again, they've been with us for a long time. In fact, the history is Lieutenant Ross Cooper formed Norco Citizens Patrol in August of 1995. We currently have 21 active members who volunteer all of their time to assist the Norco Sheriff's Office and the citizens of Norco in maintaining their quality of life. The average length of service of our members is nine years. Last year they spent 221 days working patrol where they help us basically as a crime deterrent by acting as high visibility patrol in areas where we're having issues and problems. 
They drove a total of 14,748 miles in their three patrol vehicles. They volunteered a total of 5,981 hours to the city of Norco. And some of the things they do for us besides routine patrol, they respond to call outs and that could be anything from major traffic collisions to crime scenes to spills and issues involving road closures. They help direct traffic at large scale events down power lines and some of the things that I've discussed. They're there at all of our events, helping with traffic control and parking at the Norco Rodeo, the fair and the other events at Ingalls. They provide crisis security for our deputies. They help with public presentations at neighborhood watch meetings and other community meetings. And basically serve with us side by side. And what makes it really remarkable is they do this all in the spirit of volunteerism and serving the community. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Berwin, would you like to start? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, on Saturday, I attended the uh, veterans ceremony up at our lovely veterans memorial up there at Eagles Park. It was a great ceremony, as all in Mark. On the vector control report, as of this date, we have had four horses in Riverside County with West Nile. Two of them was here in Norco, one of them didn't make it. Don't know the status of the other because they won't give us a report on them. And we've also had two human cases here in Norco. Don't know who they were because that's confidential, they won't tell you that. But remember, vaccinate your horses and spray yourself when you go outside because there is deadly mosquitoes in the area. RTA, uh, their little program that they started last year for the kids in the summertime to be able to ride anywhere they want to for 25 cents. Well, they continued it this year from uh, late June the 1st till September the 5th or whatever. But this year they had 160,000 kids rode those buses. They, a lot of people, uh, a lot of the kids ride them to the beach and everything, but uh, a very, a very popular program, 160,000 kids ride for a quarter. And on the, uh, the new bus service that we just opened up, I told you about it last month, uh, called Rapid Link, it runs from UCR to the Corona Transit Center down here on North Main. And uh, it's a huge success. It, it, it cuts about 30 minutes off of a person's ride from the university to the uh, uh, transit center by taking that instead of the regular bus because it only has so many stops. And it's just growing more every day, more ridership. On the uh, RCTC, not much on that except they're doing a lot of planning on the uh, getting ready for the 15 freeway uh, expansion and everything. One of the major things coming up starting this fall probably will be uh, a major overhaul of the interchange at the Ontario exit and uh, 15 freeway out there in South Corona. It's, it's just jammed up all the time. It's Magnolia it used to be, so they're going to redo it and try to ease the traffic. But it's hard to ease the traffic when they keep building more homes. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Berwin. Rob? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We did have an unload committee meeting and I wanted to let everybody know the meetings are open. Our next meeting will be October 23rd, and we are going to change the venue over to Norco High School. Uh, so we'll be getting more information out about that. But those meetings are public, and it's a great way to come listen to guest speakers on uh, topics that are um, current and relevant for the youth in our community. Uh, the other thing I wanted you to know that on November the 1st, from 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock, in this room, they'll be having the judging for the Red Ribbon Week 
uh, activities. So there's writing, there's posters. If anybody, again, that can be anybody in this room or anybody watching the video, can even give 10 to 15 minutes of time. You can come in and judge creative writing or posters and help the Red Ribbon Week Committee uh, select the winners that would be submitted to the county for the county contest. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I attended the Party Partners uh, program uh, last month. There were 68 uh, participants along with about 30 some guests. Brian, I want to compliment Peggy and the whole staff over there. Excellent job. Those, those folks have had a good time. <laughs> They dance better than I can, I can tell you that. Uh, but it was, it's a lot of fun, and I, I, I think that's one of the few uh, programs that we we don't take enough care of in time to really appreciate what your staff does. So kudos to uh, Peggy and I think it's Angie. Yeah, they're, they're, they really do an excellent job. Also, uh, uh, since I'm the chair of the Veterans Committee, November 11th, please put it on your calendar, Saturday. Uh, we're having Veterans Day uh, Memorial uh, up at Ingalls Park at the uh, George A. Ingalls uh, Memorial Plaza. And that will start at 9 a.m. Jeff Cahan is not here, so he's our chairman of the activities. Uh, please get a hold of Jeff if you have a flag you need to retire. Uh, that is what we have. We do a flag retirement. Uh, uh, function that day. And then... Uh, both uh, council person, uh, Grant Meyer, and myself, along with staff, uh, went over the biosecurity plans for uh, with uh, the animal control. We got a blessing from uh, the vets at uh, Cal, uh, the Department of California Food and Agriculture. So we're looking forward to seeing that in front of the council here. First, November first. November first. So I think I think you could be most of the council members will be. Please do what we did, and I think the community will do. Uh, just like uh, it's very important animal health, and since we are in an animal keeping area, that everyone start paying attention to how we keep our animals safe, especially since we're in a closed area like this. All right, that's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Kevin. Uh, quite a few things sort of piggyback off. I did not go to the uh, party partners. I went to Norco football and watched them eviscerate Chino Valley, which was a lot of fun. And then uh, Ted came along a little bit later, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, Brian was wrong. They didn't score 50. They scored, what, 57 or something crazy? Uh, <laughs> what the other team scored? Zero. Um, also, to piggyback, uh, the Veterans Committee, um, one of the things that we discussed is we are submitting, and I'm doing this because Justin's sitting back there, we're submitting two very uh, worthy veterans, and hopefully they will be chosen for the annual um, Veterans Committee. Uh, Lewis Wright and Don, they were both very instrumental in building our memorial, which is the nicest memorial in the United States, just so we're clear on that. Um, Justin is Sabrina Zavante's representative. Um, I see all the queens are there. I attended their pageant. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much, girls. I actually thought I'd be there for like a half an hour, and Arlene wouldn't let me leave. <laughs> but I had a great time. I stayed all the whole time, and I really enjoyed myself. Um, I also attended, uh, on behalf of council, the Boy Scout Distinguished Citizens, where former Mayor Kathy Azevedo received an award. It was pretty amazing. Um, Jim Polly and uh, the, the uh, um, city manager of Eastville received awards, and it was pretty cool. Unload, I attended also with Robin. Uh, the schools committee, uh, for me, the most important part was the film festival, which will be uh, in late February. Uh, right now, what we're doing is we're assembling films of Norco High graduates who have have gone on. Uh, Eagle or there's actually quite a few people that have either appeared in films, directed films, produced films, or even just been the lighting designers. So we're going through trying to pick some of those. There are some strange cats who graduated from Norco High School. <laughs> there's one about bugs, haunted bugs in the river bottom. It's very strange. Um, went to the star meeting today, the seniors, Brian, I gotta tell you, the, the, the stuff you put together for seniors with about 35 cents is amazing. And Peggy does a great job. Um, it's just a great program and all the, the stuff you have going there. So if you just pass it on once again, it's terrific. Um, Roger and I met with the County Film Commission uh, it's now, um, it's homogenous, it's, it's consolidated itself, and one of the things that EDAC is working on 
is a location guide because Norco actually um, is a very good area for location because it's easily mattable. So you can go down a trail in Norco and even if there's something behind you, just mat it out. Uh, but locations, everybody thinks of, you know, a western town or something, but we think gas stations, you think a target, you think. So right now, um, I'm working with them to assemble a location guide that's really, really exciting. A lot of money gets brought into your community because of filming. Um, GG report, we issued our report last night, which was really exciting. GG, of course, is the bond for the school district. Um, if you look at some of the schools, I won't go into it, but some of the schools are really getting amazing makeovers. Uh, they're getting safety fencing, they're getting the latest technology, which is not part of the GG grant. Um, but it, it's really, really wonderful that our schools are, are being really, really built up and, uh, and improved. Uh, Narco L, uh, in about nine months, is going to look just sensational. Uh, they're going to begin work on Narco Intermediate. Um, I went to the RCA, which is the Regional Conservation uh, Authority. Not much to report there. Basically what that is is we're trying to save land. We bought quite a bit of land. Uh, to help make a pathway for wildlife um, from Marietta Temecula down all the way to Norco on the river. Uh, WR Cog, very interesting stuff. Um, I went to a millennials conference and uh, millennials don't think like we think. And it's very interesting. Uh, they want to serve, but they don't want to really join, but they want to serve, they want to feel like they're doing something. And one of the things they're talking about doing on a regional level um, is to create a center where you develop insp inspiring things. You gather, you listen, learn, eat, and explore. They talk about sustainability, good food, uh, tech displays, and it's all designed to try to attract those people in their early 20s, mid 20s, and early 30s. Uh, really, really, really exciting. And uh, there was a lot of controversy about it, but I made the comment I thought it was brilliant. And so I think it's going to be very, very cool. Very excited about this. Um, like I said, millennials are very different people. Uh, we have our wheelchair basketball tournament com coming up in the last weekend of the month. We have eight teams. We've doubled in size. I'm really excited about that. Um, we've gone. We have two teams playing at the prison, and actually, Dr. Gray, who founded the Rolling Devils, the very first team in wheelchair history to get national attention, his children are all, all coming to that game at the prison. So I'm really excited about that. Um, Justin, maybe a representative of you. It's like going to the NBA Finals. You have all these incarcerated veterans watching this wheelchair basketball game, and it's, it's insane. Um, then I have, uh, last night, the Corona North Unified School District um, passed a resolution to support our nomination to the National Register of Historic Places for the uh, Fleet Missile Systems Analysis and Evaluation Group at the Old Naval Hospital Corona. Um, I won't read all this, I may have sent it to all of you, but what my favorite part is, and understand the claim is this doesn't exist, but what they say is, where is the Rolling Devils, the first nationally publicized wheelchair basketball team in America, played the first organized game to two organized wheelchair teams in history? That did happen, and I think it's very, very important that people understand that. They wrote a, a beautiful resolution, which will go to the State Historic Preservation Commission. Um, I think Robin covered the unload stuff. Uh, to solve. And then at the, we did get a report at WRCOG from um, the League of Cities and a little bit of a progress note on AB 649. It really looks like the governor is not going to sign it. He's getting enormous pressure. Um, and the fallout for those that voted for it, no offense, is significant. And. Uh, I'm really hoping he doesn't sign it, but Aaron seemed to feel that there's, there's hope because he, apparently when he doesn't discuss something, um, then there's a good chance he won't sign it, but who knows. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, we're gonna move into city council consent items. The staff wish to pull or discuss any items? to approve. I'll pull C. Okay, uh, C. Uh. Okay, we have a move. Uh, where would you want 
make a motion to approve all the rest? Yes. Okay. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Councilman. Council Member Hanna to, um, and a second from Mayor Newton to approve the remaining consent calendar items. Roll call. Council Members Bash? Yes. Grunmeyer? Yes. Hanna? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hoffman? Yes. And Mayor Newton? Yes. Thank you. Motion passed 5 0. Okay, we'll go to item 2C. Uh, Ted? Mr. Mayor, the reason I pulled that, it, if you're reading it, it's similar to AB 649, which we all opposed. And the reason I, I, I wanted to bring it up is that so that the people and, and can explain in a chat or it's can answer explain, even though this reads like 649, it is not 649 because it has to do with the cable industry or the city attorney can explain it, but I, I, I can't. But I just want the people to know this, this is totally different uh, at first, when you read it, I thought it was, and then I, well, why are we doing this? But then, uh, more it was explained to me it wasn't. So, I'm going to let the uh, city attorney, if I can, Mr. Mayor, explain why we're doing it. Well, I have a question. So, maybe let me ask my question to you and try to address that. Also, or Chad or Steve, whoever. Where I've heard from with this is that um, the, the part of this. Uh, deals with uh, cultural, historic, uh, biological resources and current land zoning, which falls under all the uh, elements of our general plan. Why wouldn't Planning Commission at some point look at this application, since it, it affects all Planning Commission functions? And, and with that, and also paid fees, uh, to planning for a planning commission review? The general answer is that they're not subject to condition permit, which is the process for planning commission. That's what they'd be approving. Uh, and in granting, uh, I guess, the, what, they're, what they're seeking with the application, which is not what we're discussing tonight, which is the easement, um, is to the right to get to the easement. This is a maintenance agreement. Um, we can't place a condition use permit on that right have the state. That's the reason it has not gone um, it is effectively subject to the planning commission's review or approval in this particular case. Okay, then who would do the review of those elements? Because it says they will provide a detailed description with their project and how it affects those elements of our general plan. I'm not sure I understand as far as the elements of the general plan. The, our, our general plan is composed of various elements. Okay. Okay. Uh, land use, uh, there's cultural, there's biological, there's noise, uh, there's six or seven of them. And some optional ones, right, Steve? But um, historical, biological, and it also says current land use and zoning. They will provide that in their application. So that's actually the application referred to as the commission. Well, I was the way. commission's energy division with those things. Okay. In order to get the uh, certificate of public convenience and necessity, it's not the city. But it still affect these items. It's, it's, right? You have to accept that during the hearing that on this public uh, the certificate of public necessity. Mobile light was required to provide the uh, PUC's energy division with those things, whether they did or whether they didn't. Have idea, but notwithstanding that, they were the uh, certificate was approved. So we would just accept that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we don't have any other action. Okay. Did you want to get any other comments? I mean, I think they addressed that. Oh, yeah, I mean, the, the, as uh, Chad's indicated, it's a maintenance agreement. It's, with, it's uh, subject to this certificate of public convenience and necessity, and it's for uses within the existing public right of way. It doesn't bear any relationship to the uh, subject of the you know, proposed statute, and which uh, really pertains to mobile phones. So, this is mobile. 
and the only reason I say no is because this is more of cable companies than it is cellular phones, and that's what yeah. it is. Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not satellites. It's not satellites, it's not feed. So that's, I just wanted everyone to be aware of this is, this is apples and oranges more or less, even though I don't like that game. They can do whatever they want, but the state credit is not appropriate. Yeah. Any other discussion? With that, I move to approve. Second. Or, so. Right. One more time. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, so I have a motion from Mayor Putan Hoffman and a second from Council Member Hanna. Cheryl isn't so boxy. How do you control Roll call. Council Members Bash? Yes. Redmeyer? Yes. Hanna? Yes. Mayor Potent Hoffman? Yes. And Mayor Yu? Yes. Thank you. Motion passed by zero. Thank you. Uh, I will now go into uh, item four public comments. I do have ours. Does the clerk have comments? I sure do. Thank you. First one, Gary Lewis. And I'll remind everybody, try, these are items not on the agenda, and try to keep it close to three minutes. How old are you guys? We are doing good evening. Evening. Good evening, good evening honorable you. mayor, city council, uh, also supervisors and directors. Uh, Arlene Lewis and myself, Gary Lewis, are owner of the Miss Horco pageants. And we are now, I think, 11 days into our next reign for our queens, and we've accomplished six events. We do in, uh, we support people internationally. We support a young lady in high school in Africa through Compassion International. And we also make uh, headways into Orange County, San Bernardino, Riverside also. Uh, when someone calls and says that their apartment is burnt down and their high school student shows up to school wearing the same clothes five days in a row, we reach out, we buy her all new clothes, we take Christmas gifts and clothes to the family. So that's who we are. Primarily with the girls, what we want to do is increase uh, social and personal growth. We want them to increase their insight, knowledge, and experience within the community. And additionally, willingness to help others, increase self-confidence, become more altruistic, expand their skill sets, uh, take on, get used to taking on challenges, generate pay, passion, and have fun. And what, what I'm looking forward to, and the girls already have accomplished this, is we'd like to introduce other communities to what Norco has to offer. So we want them to know that volunteerism is very much alive in Norco, and we want to put that in our forefront. So I'd like to introduce the young ladies today. And I'm also retired through uh, Corona Police Department after 27 years as a lieutenant. Also, I have careers in banking and uh, restaurant management. And my wife, uh, her grandma, owned Trina's Restaurant. Retired 14 years from Honey's. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll introduce the girls, because we don't want to go over our time. Do we have a... Hi, my name is Isabel Vieta, and I'm six years old. I'm your pixie, Miss Norco Pixie Dust. Alright. Hi, I'm Kieran. I'm your Norco Little Queen. Hi, I'm Gracie and I am Miss Norco Junior Princess and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Hi, my name is Diana Satina and I'm 10 years old. I'm your Miss Norco Junior Queen. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Kylie Gallardo and I'm Miss Norco Preteen Queen representing Eastwell. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Brianna Rogers and I'm Miss Norco Junior Teen Queen. Good evening, my name is Selena Sanchez and I'm your Miss Norco Teen Princess and your fan favorite. Good evening, I'm Kristen Weil and I'm your Miss Norco Junior Teen Princess. Hi everybody, thanks for having me. I'm Nicole Tom, I'm your Miss Teen Norco. Hello, my name is Vanessa Diaz, I am your Miss Queen Norco. 
Good evening, my name is Brianna Weibel. I am your Miss Norco Queen. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Alexandra Vialta. I'm 24 years old. I am your Mrs. Norco Queen representing Corona. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you all. time in our community and others, so guarantee. Do you have anything else you'd like to say? Oh, no, no. Okay. Oh yeah, there's a lot more I'd like to say. Uh, and for Kevin, I'm working on a screenplay. Hopefully it'll be done in less than two years, and I'd like to use Norco as a setting. Thank you, ladies. Mr. Mayor, I want to congratulate the young ladies here in the Pledge of Allegiance. You certainly heard them say very loud and clear, so thank you for your knowing your Pledge of Allegiance. Well. All right, thank you. Next person is Tosha Pesce. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. All right. I, I have a little bit to say, and I wanted to make sure I got it all in, so forgive me if I look down at my notes. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> all right. Well, I am here on behalf of Sheila Romanski, who is the founder and executive director of Crystal Roses, and she is a four-time cancer survivor. My name is Tasha Pethick, and I am the director of CR Youth, as well as on the board of Crystal Roses. I'll explain what that is. Crystal Roses Incorporated is a nonprofit organization that started to support women facing life-threatening illnesses or, con or other conditions, typically cancer, providing them with a comfort tote um, thank you. <laughs> um, to help make their treatment and recovery process a little more comfortable. Um, when I was fighting cancer, I had a lot of help and support from family and friends, and not a lot of people have that in their life and so we are also available to help um, women or children um, through that process through just meeting with them um, again giving them a tote but being there to help them through that process answer questions because all of us on the board are cancer survivors ourselves um, the crystal roses and CR youth team want to use our own journeys to inspire and encourage others as they face their own medical crisis the totes and the bags that we give um, to reach out are filled with items that make their journey a little bit easier and everything that's in our totes is absolutely free. We give it um, um, through funding that we receive uh, and it's all items that you can use during your chemo process because there's certain things you can't use. And so everything that we put in there, we make sure that it's usable. Um, my own journey began in March of 2016 when I was diagnosed with two different types of breast cancer and soon after found out I was um, BRCA positive. So after multiple surgeries and chemo treatments, I began my own healing process and through that process, that included me joining um, Crystal Roses. And now I am the director of CR Youth. And CR Youth just stands for Crystal Roses Youth and I have 10 amazing children that are on my youth squad. And these kids have a passion for helping other people, um, other children, children that are going through the illness themselves or children that their parents or family members are going through those illnesses. Um, we meet, we decide how we're going to reach out to these children or to their families, um, and then we go to events. Uh, and and just we're just able to reach out. So we're growing these children to be our youth for tomorrow, um, to be able to get in out there and, and help people the best that they can. Um, we do have a website. I would love for you to visit and just see what we're about a little bit more about our board and who we are, and that's crystalroseshelps.com. And I do have some business cards, and I would love for um, to be able to put them on the table and maybe people can grab them. So that would be completely awesome. And I do have I do have a tote, and I do have a man tote. So if there's anybody you know or anybody even here right now that could use one, I would be totally honored to be able to give that to someone to be able to help them. So thank you. Well, does anyone want a tote? 
have anybody you know going through anything? All right. Well, well if, if you'd mind. like to. Um, yes? Friend who just got diagnosed, but she's not sure where she's exactly. That's awesome. We just well, that's fine. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I knew I brought it for a reason. Right. <laughs> and, and if you like to leave your cards out on the, the table, yes. that'd be fine. If you'd like to give one to the city clerk, perfect. Then we'll have that information in City Hall. Thank you so Thank much you for so all much. you do. Thank you. Thank you. Justin Hi Justin. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor. Council. Good, how are you? Good. Um, Justin DeWale here to provide a brief update from Assemblymember Sabrina Cervantes' office. Um, on the legislative side, two of the Assembly members' bills have been signed into law by Governor Brown. Um, that is AB 1618, which uh, will create a certification process for um, veteran service organizations and also a competitive grant um, process for those organizations. And then AB 226, which will ensure that spouses of active duty military mem um, members are prioritized in the teacher credentialing process. So those two bills were signed by the governor. There are six more of her bills sitting on the governor's desk, so hopefully we'll get some news in these uh, coming days. Um, we are uh, having um, uh, several events coming up in the district. Um, firstly is uh, we are hosting a pet adoption um, on Saturday, October 21st. That's going to be at East Vale City Hall, which is on Lima Knight Avenue, um, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, we are working with uh, the Norco Animal Shelter, um, Second Chances Rescue of Norco and Wayfaring Felines of East Vale on that. Um, so come out the first, I think it's the first 30 pets are going to be adopted at a reduced price, so come out early. Um, and then on Wednesday, October 25th, um, there will be a, the assembly members hosting a select committee on veterans education and employment um, hearing here at Norco College. Um, that is going to be 1.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. on the 25th. Um, it's going to be held in the Centers of student, for Student Success at the college, um, and hopefully we're going to have the whole committee there um, going to discuss some of the great work on veteran services that the college is doing, as well as their um, soon-to-be uh, new Veteran Resource Center there on campus. Um, so that is very exciting, and the hearing will be followed by a project unveiling for the, for the Resource Center that afternoon. Um, and then, as Councilmember Bash mentioned, um, on Saturday, October 28th, our office, along with a few other legislative offices, will be hosting um, a Veterans Recognition Program um, to recognize veterans who have made outstanding contributions in their communities. Um, so that's going to be at the Marchfield Air Museum over at the base. Um, and uh, nomination forms are due pretty soon. They're due on October 10th. Um, if you would like a form, um, go to our website or, or give our office a call, um, and those will be submitted to uh, Senator Richard Roth's office. Um, and that, that's all I have for tonight, unless there are questions. Any questions? Justin, thank you. Thank you. He's good. Bonnie <laughs> <laughs> Slager. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Bonnie. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for opening up Corydon staging. You made a lot of people very happy, and also improving the access at the end of Hillside down to the river has made a lot of people happy as well. Um, I was riding with some ladies last Sunday, and they said, if Norco's worst town, why aren't there places to park and ride? And I said, well, you can park at Ingalls Park. I have no idea. Where can you park at Ingalls Park? And there's some other areas, but that information doesn't seem to be known. And it seems like there should be a way that we could get information out for people. You know, they're not spending huge sums of money in town, but they come and they like to ride and eat lunch somewhere or shop and so on. And, and uh, I'd, I'd like to see something happen so that park and ride information was available. And finally, River Drive is still really a mess. 
we were riding along there and uh, some ladies drove by and stopped us and said, be really careful. We were walking our dog and it's the footing is so sharp the dog cut its paw. So it still needs a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, and we're aware of it. Okay, Terry McCoy. Hi, Terry. Hi. Thanks. I'm nowhere as eloquent as he is. I'm sorry, I'm just a private citizen. I've never spoken in front of a city group before. This is important. Um, my name is Terry McCoy, and I was resident for the city of Norfolk for 15 years. The first house I ever bought when I was a kid it was right over on Valley View. A couple of years later, I bought the property next door, which uh, was um, some units next door to that. They're at 23, uh, 2843 Valley View. I've owned those for 25 years. I'm here to uh, correct an oversight or mistake that uh, needs to be corrected. Beginning of uh, this year, the city adopted a new sewer calculation policy that um, must have been designed to address new large multi-story developments, residential developments like down by Ganal Lumber or something that seemed to be all around us. But it's affecting my property. Um, when uh, it, at first I just thought my my renters were just using tons of water, but when uh, it became evident to my property management company that this new calculation had occurred, I went and talked to uh, the uh, public works director, Chad, he's here this evening, and uh, told him of the problem. Um, prior to this action, my sewer bills were like $51 a month, and now my sewer bills are $750 a month. That's um, if it went from 51 to 71 dollars, I understand things go up, but this went up 1,400 percent. Anybody who has a car rental, if it went up 1,400 percent, I'm sure they find how that makes their car not valid anymore. Um, he told me he said since you have four units there, they have uh, you know more possibility for residents and it could use more water. Even if that calculation were true and you raised it 300 percent. That would be $200, and that would be for four units. However, the four units that I have there, these are very small units, they're only 600 square feet. There's only one bathroom, and the entire building is only 2,400 square feet. I have, um, the first exhibit that I have here is a picture of the subject property, and um, I'll pass these around. The, the, uh, the property doesn't look any different than any of the other surrounding properties that are around it. As you well know, there's lots of properties in Norco that are more than 2,400 square feet being built now and have more than four bathrooms in it. And they're not subject to those kind of fees. The second letter I have here is a letter from my property management company, Samantha Moss, who's the accountant. And she says, uh, he, he said, we were notified by mail that this was gonna happen at the property address. Well, I don't live there, my tenants do. And that we're not notified in the mail. And she opens up the mail and pays those bills. And, and this is her testament that that was uh, never notified of her. But even, even if it was, I don't think it's the city of Norco's intention to take somebody that's been, that has an old building that's been there for 70 years, 20 years prior to, before the city of Norco was even here, and reclassify it to meet these modern standards for these giant buildings. Um, I have been to fair housing and I talked to them about it because one of the options he said well you can simply pass the costs on to the tenants. I have some lower income uh, tenants in there. There are not a lot of places where a lower income person can keep a horse and um, this is a valuable thing to a community like this. Um, I also have some tenants that are victim of, of domestic violence and this is a letter from the uh, Exhibit, exhibit three, a letter from the fair housing people that says, I can't pass on those kind of costs to those kind of people. My exhibit four is uh, the city of Norco zoning map, where I'm currently zoned A120. It's been like that forever and ever. I'm blocks and blocks away from anything commercial. I shouldn't be zoned commercial. I should be paying commercial rates for things like that. The, um, the, there's, there's never going to be a commercial building there. I'm not going to be able to build a shopping center there. I'm not going to be able to operate a manufacturing plant. It's been residences uh, for as long as the city of Norco's been around. The definition of, uh, in Merriam-Webster, the definition of residence is used as a residence or by residence. I, I also have a copy of that. Um, I don't imagine there's a lot of properties that 
are falling into this kind of crack. And I don't imagine it was the city council's intent to um, come after just small, small potatoes people like me. Um, maybe there's only a dozen or something. They would have to be units that existed before the city of Norco, before 1964. I, there can't be very many of them at all, but changing these rules and regulations at this point completely throws my my business upside down and um, and um, makes it uh, worthless because I can't even sell it to somebody else if it's if it's going to cost um, you know a fourteen hundred percent increase for uh, sewer usage and that's just the sewer bill that's not even including the water or anything else um, the sewer bill is now one fourth of the total gross rents that I even collect on the entire property. The justification as to why I think this should go back to the way it was and it should be reduced is it is res residential property merely by definition. It's grandfathered in, it's been there for 75 years, it was built as people were returning from World War II and was there 20 years before the city was, um, in, power, was uh, in control of that and the city and the county of Riverside considered residential property and even the city of Norco considered residential property for all this time. It's been owned by me for 25 years. It's been used like a residence. It's not used commercially. There's people taking showers and washing clothes and washing their cars and watering the yards and their horses. You can look here that there's horse keeping and grass and things like that. That uses a lot of water. And that's, you know, when people own a Burger King, they don't use that much water. Um, and it's horse keeping. And this, all this is going to do is force people, someone like myself to say, okay, then the tenants can't have horses because horses use a lot of water. For a city that prides itself on horse keeping, this, this doesn't seem like something that the city wants to be interested in. I'm going to have to ask you that. Okay, I'll wrap it up here. Thank you. So, um, I've thought about this a lot, the remedies that I think are possible. Um, a lot of times when a city has a piece of property that they want to reclassify, sometimes they say, okay, well, it's going to operate this way, and then if it's ever sold, it's going to, to, it's going to have to move, or it's going to be this, or it's going to be that. Um, I'm a reasonable person. I think... What makes the most sense, if the city really is hammering about money in these in these meters, then they should do the right thing and put in three more meters, and I'll pay for the plumbing of the other three units to accept the meters, and then you get what the city probably wants, which is uh, single meters for uh, single uses of, of residences, um, just like all the stuff that's around it. So if, if you guys are... Interested in any of this? Yes, stuff? if you would, take a look please, at would you give your documents to the clerk and then, um, if, if, um, assuming we have your contact information, obviously, since you, you had discussions you with uh, our public works director, what I'm going to ask is uh, our city manager to review this and then contact you. Thank you very much. I, I do appreciate your time yeah. for the, uh, helping with this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Elvis Street. Good evening, Mr. Pat and, and the City Council. Good things happening in Norco and problems, but we always manage to somehow take care of them. Um, I just want you to know that I'm really greatly distressed to hear about this litigation uh, against the city of Norco to change our at-lodge voting practices and history, which have well represented us um, and protected our very unique lifestyle and city government to districts. Um, we have no areas, I don't think, of unrepresented citizens. Um, our city council in the past and present uh, have at large represented the citizens to preserve Horsetown very, Horsetown USA very well. Precincts are not going to work in this city. Um, I can just picture a gerrymandered mess if they, if they tried to do it. I, I hope that we can fight this in any way possible. Uh, I'd just like to go on record to say I'm totally against precincts and I'm distressed to find out that this, this is happening and coming toward us. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. No more. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move into item 5A, appointments to the Norco Youth Advisory Council. Uh, city clerk is going to give the report. 
Now you guys can give me a hard time. Absolutely. <laughs> Mayor and council members, uh, the appointments to the Norfolk Youth Advisory Council was established uh, by yourself uh, over a year ago in 2016. And this, the purpose of it was to have the youth of the community advise the council or commissions on um, projects, programs, specifically geared to the, to the youth. Um, some of the topics, uh, related topics that, and issues that they would um, look into is engaging the community, uh, show leadership, and just the work together for the betterment of the community, youth community. The um, requirement, requirements were recently uh, revised to include not only Norco High School and JFK High School students, 9th to 12th grade, but also to include uh, high school students that are either homeschooled, attending a private school, or other schools outside the local school district, but reside in Norco. Uh, this was done in, um, in August, and we extended the application uh, deadline to an additional um, two weeks to September 25. We received an, a total of 10 applications by this deadline. I guess I'm supposed to be showing you this fun thing here. Sorry about that. I told you guys to have fun with me. Okay, so this is the resolution that was approved, changing the requirements, which opened up the window for more students to apply. And these are our 10 applicants. Um, a few of them have filled out speaker cards to speak to you tonight. <coughs> Staff recommends that City Council make up nine appointments for the vacant seats, um, which was established by the resolution adopted recently. And um, their commission, or their, yeah, their commission begins um, October this month through May of 2018. So it works with a school, school schedule. And if you have any questions, I can try to answer them. Thank you, Diane. Does council have any questions for the clerk? If not, uh, we'll hear some cards, but I would uh, certainly encourage all the uh, applicants, feel free to speak and okay. be relaxed and have fun. Our first applicant, Isabel Henry Emerson. Thank you. Hi, Isabel. Hi. How are you? Good, thank you. Hi, my name is Isabel Henderson. I'm a sophomore at Norco High and also a two year member of the Norco FFA chapter. I have been very active in my community thanks to FFA. I have attended almost every work event there's to offer and worked there. So ever since I was little, I've always wanted to help change the world. And one step closer to that is being on the Youth Advisory Council, where I can start by helping my community. With being appointed to the Norco Youth Advisory Council to the best of my ability, fulfill the task given and work efficiently and effectively with my team. Thank you for considering my application. Oh, don't leave yet. <laughs> Does council have any questions for this applicant? I <laughs> I have one for you, Izzy. What's been your favorite activity that you volunteered at in the city of Norco? So far, Norco Rodeo, because I'm there like every night. <laughs> Who's your favorite Norco High ag teacher? <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem. Karen Pestaneda. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, hello, my name is Corinne Castaneda. Um, I'm currently a senior at Norco High School. I feel honored to attend here tonight concerning the Norco Youth Advisory Council and having been invited and encouraged to apply has only really created a deeper zeal within myself to want to partake within this council. Um, being that I've grown up in the city of Norco for my 17 years of living thus far, um, I've only been able to gain some more insight that I feel that I can really bring forth to this council. Um, a big part of the youth within the city is athletics, and I myself, growing up, have partaken in an abundant amount of athletics. 
Um, from an inside perspective of my own in uh, playing and partaking them, and also from an outside perspective and having three older brothers and watching them play and growing up. Um, there are many attributes, attributes that I can see that can be brought to these already established programs within the city of Norco to really enhance the youth's experience in promoting a positive environment and um, really just being a, a unifying factor to bringing the youth together and um, having all the youth ages from a high school level down to those that are just starting and beginning in extracurricular activities. And being on this council would really give myself an opportunity to create and promote ideas that are gonna be cost effective and realistic. Um, while I really think being a motivational and positive factor is really important. Um, and I also think that my knowledge of these programs and experience within them is one of the strong set of tools that has given myself the ability to reach these goals and be effective within the council. Thank you. Well, thank you. So what do you do with Parks and Rec? I am um, currently employed in the gym as an attendant, so there I do working the scoreboards, and um, I also have given, been able to be given the opportunity to work in uh, We People, so with youth, with younger kids, and running um, the summer, summer program, and watching them, and um, really has given myself a wide range of perspective from those kids that are older, but to see the younger ones work, and how they work, in, and just basic things from games, and and what excites them. And um, also, I've been given the opportunity to be a part of Party Partners, which I think, um, to me, is a really interesting thing to view because, you know, you see people from a different aspect of life that, you know, it's something that they get excited about and that they love, and I love being able to be there. And um, it's a really unified community thing to see people come there and just enjoy time for one night with dancing and music and food. Um, I had the honor of being able to meet a council member over here, Ted Hoffman, and um, that was really neat. And so just the experiences that I've been able to see thus far within my experience in working for Parks and Rec has been very, very cool. And actually, uh, Crystal, she was my um, teacher when I was younger, so it's kind of come full circle for me and right. being able to be involved in the city. Good deal. Does council have any other questions? Who's your boss? <laughs> right here. There you go. It's good, right good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I need to clarify. She says work. Is she a paid worker or a volunteer? She's a paid worker. I'm sorry to say she does not qualify. We did not know that. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can. It's part of the stipulations you cannot work for the city. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, I did not know that. Yeah. I'll leave it in your hands. The next person, Clint Nickel. Okay, we'll, we'll discuss that at the end. I'll leave it in your hands. Clint Nickel. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Clint Nickel. I am 17 years old and I attend Notre Dame in Riverside. And I am very interested in joining the North, Norco Youth Advisory Council. I'm very proud to live in Norco. I appreciate the patriotism and the Western theme in general. I have participated in Taekwondo. I've learned to swim in the community pool. And for as long as I can remember, up until high school, I've played Norco Little League. Um, I participated in many of the community events, including the fair, the rodeos, and the parades. And I volunteered at the animal shelter, the post office food drive, the church pantry, and have donated blood. I would like to thank you all very much for opening up the application, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Does council have any questions? You realize you almost said more Corona. <laughs> almost. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you, man. Allegra Rosa. Hello. Um, my name is Allegra Rosa. I'm currently enrolled in J John F. Kennedy Middle College. Being a JFK student enabled me to take college courses during my high school. 
Um, I go to Norco um, Community College. Um, my goal is to get my associate degree in social behavior and business administration. I'm currently a swimmer for CHOP at Norco High School. And I'm BSU, which stands for Black Student Union, secretary at my school. I've lived in Norco for quite a while, and I've always wanted to be involved at the, for the city. And when I saw the, that this opportunity was being holded, um, I was really interested, and I have been involved for this. I'm currently involved um, for Norco Elementary as a, I'm a student right now, and I mean, I'm, I'm a volunteer for, and yeah. It's pretty fun, actually, yeah. like it. And doing things such as tutoring and volunteering, creating, a, creating events would be something that I would be really unfortunate to do for the city with the members. And I hope to be given this opportunity and make a difference for our future at Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Does council have any questions? Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You may recognize this next young man, Michael Young. Hi, Michael. Look familiar. Mary <laughs> Council. I'm Michael Young. I'm 16 years old and I attend Norco High School. And in the last year of being in this council, we started ideas of a skate park, a youth center, a volunteer program, and also youth government day here at City Hall. And while we did not completely set up those for this year, we can continue this year to maybe make Youth Government Day happen, or maybe volunteer program really get off the ground and have great involvement in the city. Also, it's great to, from the inaugural year, as a process, legislation takes time. So, we will continue this year and also have new ideas and have ideas from the youth. Council, have any questions? Okay. Michael, what was your favorite part of serving last year? My favorite part was being involved in helping to make Norco have, have things for everyone. Because, say, having a volunteer program or having a youth center, it really gets people to want to be in Norco, volunteer at events, or even just to hang out in Norco. They like the community. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know I put you on the spot, Michael. Because she said what was the best part about it. What was your disappointment last year and how are you going to correct it if you're on it? Well, I didn't realize at first how long some things took to really happen. I learned that later in the year. And not so much you can do. Because uh, it does take time for everything to happen. But just to keep moving forward and everything. And also introduce new ideas that in the end we will reach our goals. So you're going to use your experience last year? You're going to use your experience last year to drive hard, right? Yes. Thank you. I have a question. What, what, what is government day? I mean, what is what would it, what would you need from us to make that happen? That seems relatively easy. What is it? Well, you think government day is a field trip between John Kennedy and Norco High School. And there will be 10 from each school that uh, would go on the trip. And they would come, kind of ghost a a person in City Hall to see what they do. And there'll also be like a mock meeting and there'll be meals and it'll be like a whole day at City Hall. As you can see we did do a lot of planning. <laughs> you know, let's let's I'll 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 ask to agenda or maybe you guys maybe whoever gets appointed make a make a recommendation. We can make that happen. We got a bus, we can bus people all kinds of stuff, can't we Ryan? We can probably make that happen. That's what the council directed we can Yeah, all right. All right. Thank you, sir. We can do that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. It'll so follow question. through. Good job. Thank you. Okay, and the next young lady, also familiar to you, Jessica Ocampo. Oh, God. She's still around. <laughs> She's still around. Hi, <laughs> Jessica. How are you? Yeah. You can give me a hard time. I remember last year, my speech was really, I was really nervous. I still am right now. But um, good evening, Norco City Council members. My name is Jessica Campo. I'm a current senior at John F. Kennedy Middle College, and I'm certainly interested in being appointed to the North Youth, Youth Advisory Council once more, hopefully. I served as a member during its inaugural year last year, uh, planning potential programs to promote youth service 
and along the way, I truly learned the value of community service. I'm proud to say that I am a regular member of um, Norco's party partners, and it's a really great thing. Um, and I hope to aid the Youth Council with promoting service by being a prime example um, through party partners and hopefully um, participating in other community service events that Norco might have. I also hope to bring along that, that past knowledge of things that we've already planned and already some knowledge of the member duties and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Rob? Well, you gave her a hard time last year. I thought maybe. Have a question. <laughs> so, what has been your involvement with party partners? Um, I volunteer there like regularly. I really enjoy um, going and doing arts and crafts with people there. I really like socializing with them, so I like talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'm not really much of a dancer. I try, so sometimes I like switch from the arts and crafts and go dancing with them. It's a really nice experience to just be able to talk to a diverse set of people, and it's really nice. It's, it re it's relaxing, and it's just... It's accepting. It's an accepting environment, really. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Can I ask a question? Um, how many college classes have you taken? Um, I have about 30 units oh. so far. Incredible. So how close are you to an AA degree when you graduate? An AA degree is 60. It's, it's yeah. actually 60 units, so I'm not very close. So you're going to you save a year of college? Um, about a year? Um, yeah, about a year. About a year? Mm -hmm. Good job. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Those are all the cards I have tonight. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Would you, would you do me a favor mm -hmm. and just repeat the, the speaker's names that filled out cards? The speaker's name? Yes. The applicants that uh, spoke. Sure. Isabel Erickson. Yeah, uh, Jerry Castaneda. But I'm funny, she's just called. Well, we'll. Clint Nichol. Uh, Clint. Allegra Rosa. Michael Young. And Jessica Ocampo. Okay. Does uh, council have any uh, questions, discussion? I'd like to discuss before we uh, just Isabel. Well, I think Gary was are. I thought Isabel yeah, was the one there. Is it? And I know you read them off. So it's in a misdemeanor if I can. Hey, whoever. It is. Go are, right the other, are the other applicants in the room? Please stand up and say hi. <laughs> All I just want to see. You know, we've got to look at nine names, so I'd like to see who <laughs> they are. I'll be back. Come on up and introduce yourself. Just introduce yourselves. You don't have to speak. Just Bur one doesn't bite. We don't. We don't do that. <laughs> Um, I'm Alexis LaRue. I've been in the world of my life, so... Did you repeat your name again? Alexis LaRue. No, I'm not a lady. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, I... Anthony Garcia. Here. Is that Noor Nindra? And I'm gonna miss one, Nicole Logan. And I think that's it. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Player, <coughs> my right. What I'm stalling here, so go ahead and talk. Okay. You or Diane, what about the one that she said was ineligible? I'll, I'll comment probably. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to work a note here with John. The, so, yeah. the, the, the issue which 
Diane, Andy, is, is whether or not a city or any employer can have a volunteer who also serves in a, a paid capacity. Uh, the general rule and doesn't, I never thought about applying these circumstances, but the general rule is no. That, uh, when you're a paid employee, you don't have the legal ability to provide volunteer work to the agency. Uh, we don't allow uh, paid employees to be on other commissions. What I'm going to suggest is that if you choose to appoint her, that you appoint her, go, go ahead and do it, and it will be subject to our review to see whether or not there's a way opportunity. I mean, I don't know enough about the facts related to her. It is said by resolution, though. Pardon? It is said by resolution. It's not just a, a policy. It's, oh, it that, is yeah, so in I, the requirement. Actually, the resolution is pretty much irrelevant to what the state law okay. is. Okay. That's the big and John, having been a former public employee, and I agree with you that you can't volunteer for a job that you normally do. But this is what you'll have to look at is if this isn't something that he or she normally does, would that fall into that same category? In other words, as a retired law enforcement, I couldn't volunteer as a law enforcement officer, but who knows if Scott needed me to be a fireman, I can be a volunteer fireman. It's not the same job. So, I mean, it's something that you'd have to look at. <laughs> and I think he would make a good volunteer fireman. Hey, I already am, so I'm an art guy, okay? I don't think I'm going to be as, as Andy has pointed out, the, the ramifications are a little broader in that, for example, if you're a secretary, can you be appointed to the planning commission? Uh, they have nothing to do with one another, and the answer is the city's been done. So. Mm. Go ahead, Kevin. Well, I hate to penalize somebody who was working and getting a job. And um, I would, I would like to appoint her and let John sort it out later, and the city manager, and just know that it's possible. But I think she showed up, and I would like to appoint her myself. I would, I would vote for her. Well, I'd like to throw another curveball into this: that uh, that we have uh, nine positions and ten applicants. And, um, but we have one, two, three that um, uh, didn't show or didn't didn't make contact uh, with us as far as a letter or email. But would you all be open to appointing nine and having the tenth as an alternate? And is there any discussion with that or any feedback? And, and would that also help us with this current situation? Just kind of, I can ask. Sure, go ahead. Diane, you had how many last year? Nine? Last year, as far as applicants? What'd you start with? No, I know. Nine. That. Nine. Nine is. Did all seven. nine of them make it through? Pardon me? How many dropped out? None. No dropped out. The two came back. The two came back. Well, that diffused my whole idea. All right, thank you. Um, I do have a question in reference to that. What you're offering to do, that tenth person, as an alternate, how do you propose that person is going to serve? Will that person be required to attend all meetings as the other nine would? Sure, not completely thinking it out, but I would certainly welcome them as a, uh, a, a attend the meeting, okay, like in the kind audience. Kind of like an alternate jury. But they're okay. And then if uh, one member was, for whatever reason, to resign, we would not have to open up another uh, um, application period that that alternate could just move right in. They don't resign on too much of them. <laughs> right, Michael? Yeah, 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 I can see him nodding his head. Um, no, that's then, Let's just say that situation However, was to occur, to that, that, that alternate would be uh, into that position. If it was one or more, then we would have to have an applicant. 
<laughs> that will you take no, the... No, not, well, not yet. <laughs> Any thoughts, Robin? I would be or open tell us to... tell a story or something. You know, like conversing back there. So, uh, obviously, I feel like it's important that we give as many opportunities for the youth to participate and get involved when we look at volunteerism in this town. Any of you that are involved in horsemen or rural or any of the other organizations in town, we desperately need younger people to step up and start joining our organizations and participating in, as volunteers. And I think this is a good step in that direction. Um, I think Jessica is a perfect example of seeing how party partners worked and she's on board as a volunteer and I think you're going to find um, that all of the students on youth advisory find their niche so um, I just think it's a good base to help our community stay the way it is and to um, encourage volunteerism with our youth and also provide mentoring when they're in these organizations and around people that care about our city and our community and attach themselves to good adults within our community, uh, those mentoring relationships can happen as well. So obviously giving opportunities to more uh, students and children is obviously better, but as we all know, bureaucracy can sometimes get in the way. I think Michael spoke to that a little bit during his uh, time as well. So we'll try and figure out over here how we're going to fix that uh, situation, but obviously in reading the applications and hearing from the young people tonight, your speeches tonight, I could tell a lot of you had written them and prepared them, and I feel like they were much better than last year than the presentations we, we had last year, so I do appreciate that and your time and putting thought into what you were going to say to us uh, when you attended this evening, so thank you. Is that enough time, Mr. Mayor? <laughs> Good job. We're, we're trying to address the current issue. Uh, and it seems like maybe one way of doing it is to appoint her as the alternate uh, non voting member. She has the rights of Brown Act, she has the right to attend, and the public has the right to participate. Uh, that probably solves all the problems. Does that Step up here, young lady. <laughs> we we want to be able to include you in this. I really appreciate that, that you taking the time. Well, well, it's good for us to think a little bit too. So, <laughs> and, and, and I like I, I like curveballs like that. But understanding the position that uh, that we're in mm -hmm. and that. Um, even though you're employed very, very part-time at a, a minimal wage that for the work that you do at, at the community center, would it be acceptable? And, and would you still be able to contribute if you were the alternate to the um, advisory committee? Yeah. You would still be able to attend all the meetings and participate as any member of the public but you would not be able to vote. Um, yes, and I first would just like to thank each and every one of you for even considering and taking the time to work that out. Um, I feel partially responsible now. I should have looked ahead in that in terms of not being no, eligible. No. But um, yes, most definitely. In, in my approach in applying for this was just not entirely, just to be a part and to promote things for the youth and um, you giving me that opportunity, all of you guys to be able to do that, I, I'm i grateful and I would gladly be a part of that. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Um, can I just make a motion to accept the remaining nine? Second. And, and then Kern would be the alternate as we discussed and still contribute and be not voting. I think that would be so fun. Is that good with everybody? I heard you, Kevin. By the way, Nicole Logan. You noticed uh, a Cubby fan? Uh, she played baseball and softball. How about that? First choice, buddy. There you go. 
<laughs> One team in this game. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion from Mayor Newton and a second from Council Member Bash to appoint the, let's say, the not nine members to the seats and the tenth member being Karen as the alternate. No, as a non voting uh -huh. member. Mm -hmm. Correct? Correct. Okay, very good. Uh, roll call. Uh, Council members. Bash? Yes. Grunmeyer? Yes. Hannah? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Hoffman? Yes. And Mayor Newton? Yes. Motion passed by zero. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a no more than 10 minute break. Is that enough time for you, Diane? Yes. And I'd like all the uh, youth advisory applicants to. Do you want to meet in this little room? Oh, okay. It's our little club room. There's <laughs> water. Food. <laughs> yeah, there's food. TVs. Um, let's come back in about 10 minutes. Okay, we're going to go ahead and reconvene. Thank you very much, Mayor. You're, you're welcome, Ms. Clark. Uh, we'll go to uh, item, uh, item 5B. This is the process and status review on accessory building regulations. Steve, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, this is a, at the request of the City Council. We have adopted ordinances 1019, 1020, and 1021 to introduce new rules and regulations pertaining to the review and approval of accessory buildings. Uh, that occurred well, almost six months ago. And so this is a six month review that the city council asked be brought forward to address the status of how things are working with the new processes. Uh, just briefly as a background, the, the new regulations came about as a result of an ad hoc committee that consisted of two city council members and two planning commission members. And then um, through various public hearings with the planning commission and the city council. Uh, it was the ad hoc's uh, direction that the categories to address accessory buildings be broken down into five categories. Uh, first one, massing of the buildings. Second one, the conditional use permit process and enforcement. Third category, lot coverage. Fourth category, preservation. And the fifth category, architecture. And then within those five categories there were discretionary and non-discretionary criteria that were established that were included both in the ordinances and in the applications and the applications but the ordinance and the applications have both are all attached as attachments to the staff report the and then ultimately what was done to help in the review process the accessory buildings were broken down into three distinct categories based upon use. First one being large vehicle parking buildings, second being large animal keeping shelter buildings, and then the third was all other accessory buildings. And just briefly what was done, I won't go into a lot of detail, but for massing, uh, rules were adopted whereby as the height of a portion of the building uh, gets higher, the in the setback requirement for that portion of the building, building also increases. So while you may have a, a, a wall that can be five feet from the property line based upon the height of it, if the peak of the roof is higher, well, the peak of the roof will determine where the building gets set, even if it moves that side wall away from where it could have been. Um, I'm confusing myself talking about so basically, as the height of the building gets bigger, the, the setback uh, requirement for that portion of the building gets bigger. The second category was the CP process and enforcement. Uh, the way it used to work was buildings that were 864 square feet or smaller were processed with a site plan review, and then buildings larger than 864 square feet were processed with a conditional use permit. That required a public hearing. Uh, the new accessory building use permit process 
now requires that all buildings get a mailed notice to surrounding property owners regardless of the size and that in its review the planning commission if it de deems that a project should be approved they need to make two findings um, the first one being that the re requested accessory building use permit is consistent with the general plan and zoning requirements of the zone in which the property in question is located including the protection of open animal areas on lots where the keeping of large animals is permitted. The second finding, the requested accessory building use permit will not have an adverse effect on the public convenience or general welfare of persons residing or working in the neighborhood and will not adversely affect adjoining land uses including runoff, drainage impacts, and architectural compatibility. So um, that was how the process was amended. Uh, replacing the that CUP and site plan process with one accessory building use permit process. Uh, the third category that was looked at was lot coverage. It was ultimately determined that rather than try to control the size of buildings through lot coverage regulations, it was better to go directly to height and setback requirements, which which I already talked about. So as far as lot coverage goes. Each of the zones where accessory or residential uses are permitted use and accessory buildings allow um, ancillary to that use, uh, there's a table in, the, in your staff report that was included in the review process before. And since all of the lot coverage calculations are different depending on the zone you're in, it, it was decided just to leave that alone. Uh, for preservation of open areas, uh, lots are either required to have a PACA or if they do not have a, a primary animal keeping area, they are required to have open areas equal to 576 square feet multiplied by the allowed number of animal units. What was done in this uh, category was that there would be a five foot setback buffer requirement between the open animal area and the site property lines and to any buildings. And then the last category was architecture and the regulations that were added to address architecture was providing articulation on walls that exceed 20 feet in length and then all the exterior wall finishes uh, match the material style and colors of the primary dwelling. Now, in addition to these five categories, um, there were, in the public review process, there were additional items that were added. Um, five main ones that I'll summarize quickly. Uh, a copy of the approved site plan and the conditions of approval have to be recorded with the county recorder's office before the issuance of a building permit. All. Um, all accessory buildings are subject to period, periodic inspection by city and city officials to ensure that the use is consistent with the approved permit and that requires a notice to the residents uh, at least 24 hours prior to the inspection. The applicant uh, in their application has to provide information on 100 year and 500 year flood zones and if their property is impacted by that. Uh, then the washroom restroom uh, was allowed to be in all accessory buildings with a minimum size of 50 square feet. And then the only way to exceed the maximum allowed sizes uh, would be through approval of a variance. That, had to, that would have to be justified with findings. In addition to these changes, the, the fees were adjusted. Uh, to reflect the full recovery cost for staff time to review and process these applications and for the planning commission or city council to, council to ultimately take action on what's being proposed to approve or deny. Uh, since the new rules were adopted, we, we've had six applications. Uh, three of them were submitted before the new fees went into effect and those have already been reviewed and approved by the Planning Commission. And in that, in that meeting, there were uh, no concerns, issues, or questions brought up in the discussion before the Planning Commission took its action. The other three have been filed since the new fees went into effect. 
and those are still in process and uh, waiting for a review by the Planning Commission. Lastly, what I'll address are some of the questions and concerns and issues that have been brought up by uh, either members of the City Council, Planning Commission, or uh, residents about the new rules and things that they feel ought to be changed. The first one is that the third category of accessory buildings, the all other category, there really is no, no need for that category uh, because it has limitations on it uh, that allow it to only be 14 feet tall with a maximum size of 864 square feet. <coughs> Uh, to, if somebody needed a larger building, all they would have to do is apply for an RV or a large vehicle parking structure, which allows buildings up to 20 feet tall and a maximum size of 1,400 square feet, and then they just don't have don't build to that maximum allowed allowances for that type of a building. So basically, you could roll the one category into the other. Uh, the second issue that's been brought up is that the graduated setback um, whereby the as the height of the building gets higher the setback requirement for it also increases um, that has a tendency to put, to put lar uh, the large recreational vehicle parking building towards the middle of a lot which can have a tendency to kind of eat up the rear portion of the property and diminish its usability, including its usability for animal keeping. A third issue that's been brought up is that on lots where there, where neighbors already have large buildings five feet from the property line, there should be a case-by-case -case consideration in the setback requirements uh, whereby the, uh, an accessory building could go within the graduated setback requirement uh, closer to where the existing building is on the neighboring lot since that view and impact is already there. Uh, there has been uh, some complaints that the fee is too high and there's been a request that some buildings um, because of the nature of the building being uh, basically a kit building that you buy from a place like Home Depot like a tough shed style building, um, by its nature, is going to automatically meet the requirements and ought to be ought to be exempt from having to go to planning commission for a review. And sizes that have been suggested have been 240 or 400, 480 square feet, with a maximum height of 14 feet. So if it was a kit building and met those uh, size requirements, uh, the the request is that those uh, be exempt from having to go to the Planning Commission. And then the last issue that's been brought up is where there is a, an accessory building uh, that has a roof and thus requires a building permit, but the roof is not solid. It's a lattice roof, like a gazebo or something like that, that um, that type of building uh, be exempt also from having having to go to planning commission. They can just go straight to building permit. So with that, I will uh, conclude my presentation. Again, just to reiterate, we've had six applications since the new rules went into effect. Three have been approved and three are awaiting going to planning commission for their uh, review uh, consideration. And I will answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. Um, Council, I have any questions? The oh, can I have one thing? I apologize. Oh, Steve, go ahead. I, I did get a request uh, during the week um, that there was in the code section uh, in chapter 18.68, there is a provision in there that says um, the applicant has responsibility for accuracy. The applicant shall be solely responsible for the accuracy of information uh, this got cut off, including surrounding property owners list and other information 
You know what? I really did not hear because I got cut off. I apologize. Okay, so the way it reads right now is the applicant shall be solely responsible for the accuracy of information submitted as part of their application. Submission of inaccurate plans, legal descriptions, application requirements, and other information and the way it was adopted uh, says may be cause for invalidation of all actions regarding this petition. Uh, that is not consistent with the way it reads in the, in the municipal code for uh, such things like a variance application where it does use the word shall. So that, that issue was brought up. Um, the way it is before you tonight is the way it, it started. It, it was presented that way all the way through ad hoc community planning commission and city council. But that is inconsistent with the way it is for instance a variance application in the municipal code. So with that I'll answer your questions. So are you asking that it be changed in regard when you have a variance application? No, no, I, I I'm asking if the council wants to change uh, the word may in this chapter for accessory buildings to be consistent with the way it reads in uh, Chow. Chow. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Berwood. Sorry. Yeah, Steve, on uh, starting on page five, and there's about six places in here, when we made these uh, regulations on, on these accessory buildings, the restroom, the washroom restroom consisting of a toilet and one basin sink is supposed to be maximum size of 50 square feet. And then every one of these it says a minimum size of 50 square feet. Well, if it stays minimum size, that means they can go ahead and make it any, any size they want to and probably put a kitchen in there. And I know when we brought this up, it was maximum size. Now it's all been changed to minimum. Well, when it when it started out, when it came out of the ad hoc committee, it was a maximum, I think, 32 square feet. And in by the time it got to city council, the discussion, the well, the issue that was brought up is that that would not meet an ADA requirement, uh, 32 square feet. And so um, it was changed to 50. And then in the ensuing discussion, it was determined that it didn't really, the council didn't really have an issue with how big the bathroom was. They could make it as big as a building that they wanted, but it could only have a one basin sink and a toilet, that's it. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, the last thing I remember that we said maximum, because if you got more than 50 square feet, then you're just saying, well, let's just go ahead and put a bedroom and a kitchen and everything else in here. Right. And, and I'd like to see. I'd like to see that okay. change back to maximum on all the on them things. Because minimum was just leaves it wide open. Do I need to make a motion to get that changed, Mr. Mayor? No. Uh, what I'd like to do if if we can just keep a list. Um, yeah, two things. Yeah, questions right now. And then we'll see if Diane has any cards. But I'd also maybe we just, Steve, if you want to do it by the numbers with uh, under your issues, concerns, and suggestions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then note uh, Council Member Anna's uh, issue or in concern with uh, restrooms maximum size. And so, what and whatever is ultimately suggested will have to come back in the form of an amendment to the ordinance. Okay, so we'll, we'll just track it all the way down the, this list. Robin? Ed? Okay, Steve, you on your issues and concerns. You're saying there's no need for a third category accessory building. Now the reason when we were on the ad hoc committee we did that to all others was to make this simple because we knew that the large RV buildings were going to take up more time because of the setbacks and then we had the horse stalls. We left the other category, the all other category, because it would to simplify it. 
somebody just wanting the small shed, not the big, big combo building or that. So I, I don't understand the issue of why we need to separate that. I we need to combine it. I think. But the way it was explained to me when the issue was brought up is what happens if somebody wants to build a thousand square foot accessory building but they don't want to park an RV in it. So they, they don't fall into that all other category. So what they could do is just apply for an RV parking building and then just not build the building to its maximum allowed height. That's That was the reason for it. Um, then on your second, the graduated setback requirements. You can't place a large vehicle parking in the middle of the property, diminishes usability of the lots. Yeah, kind of why we did it is to discourage these great big RV buildings. Yeah, I'm just reporting. I'm okay, I'm just, I'm just thinking that's kind of why we did it. Um, I don't have a problem with the case by case where there's a, a, if it's going on, but again, this is what we were trying to stop is that all these large barns and RVs, uh, the application fee is too high, you got you, you gotta pay for it. I mean, it's just, we, we, we can't absorb that. Then I'm looking at, and I agree with you, some of these prefab buildings and small, like the tough sheds and things like that, um, I don't have a problem as long as they go to the ARC committee. I know, that's what I'm saying. Okay, okay. I just say, all right, the question stage. Is there a problem if they went to just an ARC committee then? No. Okay. And, um, I just so that that would be at least be a, a part of the application and that would probably drop some of the fee then, correct? If we did that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I actually have a lot of questions. Should I wait until after the comments? Or? Sure. And we'll just amber it all out. Um, I don't know, I'll run it your body, but I'll ask a few questions. On noticing, Steve just says, you know, notice of proposed projects are mailed to property owners within 300 feet. I thought it was uh, expounded that it was that we had to have a minimum of 25 property owners, and then that radius would increase until we achieve 25 property or, uh, owners? Our, our normal public noticing is like that, the 300 feet. The accessory building is not currently like that. It's just listed as 300 feet. So if that's something that you want to change, then you would need to change it. But our, we'll say, our no, normal noticing is 300 feet or until 25 prop. Yeah, you, you increase that circle. Okay. Correct. Do you get a minimum 25 property owners? Right. Okay. So you can put that down as a issue concern. So let me ask this as a question, but it's more, it'll lead more into discussion that with, with the large accessory building, they kind of plays to what Berwin was talking about. Um, it, it says all accessory buildings uh, shall be subject to periodic inspection by city officials to ensure that use is consistent with the approved permit. Okay. That's on page five, number two. And that's not with a complaint. It, it changes if there's a, a complaint made. So, if I am I understanding this that, at, with with notice or whatever, a city official can come by and look at my accessory building to make sure I'm using it the way I said I was going to use it. Yes, but you, but understanding that we wouldn't do that unless we had concern that there was something going on that was not supposed to be going on whether there was a complaint filed against him or not. Okay. I mean, we're not just going to randomly... You know, it kind of reads that way, though, I that, that you could. 
So jot that one down, but keeping that in mind, mm -hmm. this is my concern that, let me ask this as a question, and, and the overall blanket is use. So um, I make application for a 1,400 square foot large RV storage building, okay? And within that, I want to go ahead and put half of it for my RV and half of it for a workshop. And I want to build a demising wall to separate the two uses, right? I'm not allowed to do that. Because it says here I'm not allowed to do it. Yeah. The... Yes, correct. Yeah, right. It says all over. Yeah. I'm not allowed to, to buy that. Mm -hmm. But if I was to say half of that is the size of my bathroom, that demise of wall, then it's okay. Yeah, that's why I'm Yep. But that that's kind of my biggest issue right there. That we're I'm trying to keep it as a question though. Sure. So we'll leave it at that. Um, do we have any cards? No, Mr. Mayor, no cards. Thank you. Do we have any further discussion? Or would you, or Kevin, I'm sorry. Yeah, your list, go ahead. Um, this is, uh, I just want to preface this that uh, I think the city of Norco, I mean, going way back, has really tried to find ways to make these buildings work. Most of them are banned in other communities. Um, but I want to preface, they're not homes. And uh, any new development of homes though, always requires an architectural review. And one of the things that's so strange is that people would like to put a building that is completely incompatible architecturally in a neighborhood. And so I like the fact that we've, we've changed that. Um, one of the things I did is I looked at, I actually visited 70 accessory buildings and about half of them actually worked. They were, I mean, right across the street from me. I've got a, a huge arena in the back. You don't even know it's there. But one of the things I discovered is from site plan. That's right. Anyway, from site plan to final inspection, the changes that occurred are actually incredible. I mean, buildings get five feet taller. They add square footage. Um, it appears there's no connection between the site plan and the final inspection. And one of the things I'd like to really make sure we do, we do with this is we make it fair and we base it on the municipal code and the inspector actually goes back to the site plan because our municipal code very clearly says the site plan in the application is what we go by and they have to completely tie back to that. That has not been happening. Uh, maybe it's happening now because the, the six that you've approved are, are going to be that way. But up till now, I mean, they even detail in our municipal plan exactly how that site plan originally is supposed to be used. It has, it's very specific. We have not enforced that. Um, one of the things that I think is important that we always have to tag back to is why are we doing this? And it's all contained in 1868.2, and I'm not going to read it, but basically it says it lies in a natural setting, Norco, of rural, scenic, and historic beauty. I.e., that paragraph says exactly what this municipal plan is supposed to do. And within that, what we're trying to do is we're trying to put up buildings that are conducive to that. Also, I want to remind everybody, these are not homes, these are a privilege. And as such, the primary goal of this entire document is to protect the neighbors and allow certain rights to people. Um, some of the questions I have, um, I'm a little bit confused on page two where it says massing. One of the things that was misunderstood was the 40% lot coverage. Oh, 40% lot coverage means we can put it up. That's not what the code said. So I want to make sure that in the new code, um, the lot coverage doesn't mean that somebody in the future, because what I'm really hoping is down the line, 
when we're not here, when Steve's not here, when Andy's not here, when John's not here, which seems incredible to me. Um, but I want to make sure that the next person doesn't drop the stuff out. So I want to make sure in that paragraph we're not saying 40% lot coverage. Oh, that means we can allow this. That was incorrectly utilized for almost 10 years. Are we saying in that, in that paragraph that lot coverage, it's the 40% coverage, and if it's still within that, somebody could interpret that to say, okay, it's within the 40% lot coverage. I'm asking your opinion, Steve. No, because the while lot coverage comes into consideration, the, the determining factors are going to be the setback requirements and the limitation on the size themselves. Uh, being the, uh, the third category is 864 square feet, that's it. The, the RV parking building is 1,000 with the potential to add an additional 400 square feet for like a hobby shop attached. And then the animal keeping uh, structure is based on how many animal units are allowed on the property. So the, the, the size that's identified with the use plus the massing of the structure uh, using the height and the setback requirements, those are going to be what controls the size. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So then going over to page three. Notices of proposed projects are mailed to property owners within 300 feet, and I like the change that, that Greg came up with. My question is why? Who cares? What, what do they have to say about it? Well, the intent is so that the neighbors uh, get uh, information about what's being proposed. But if they oppose it or if they feel that something hasn't been taken care of, um, I would like to find out what rights are they going to have because it's going to be in their neighborhood. Maybe a list or to, to spell it out. I don't know if that's possible to do, but up to this point, frankly, the neighbors haven't been listened to at all. And I got 50 of them, at least 50, that are upset. So why do we send it out? What, what rights are we giving them other than, hey, they're going to build this building? Just to let them know, will they have the opportunity to object? Yes, and, and the way it will work is um, in, in our new staff reports, new format, uh, to the Planning Commission, we, we give them all the options that are available to them. So they will hear uh, testimony from neighbors, whether they support or don't support. Um, and then with that, they, the Planning Commission is advised that they've got the options to approve deny or approve with changes. So that's spelled out to them. Now I'll give you an example. Chad at a meeting recently said we really like to hear from people in terms of water flow. Guess what? The people who know the water flow are the neighbors. I'd like to see some language in here. I don't know how to work it out, but uh, so that if somebody said, hey, this is going to be flooding, I mean, we're going to listen to those people somehow their input actually has some, some meaning. Um, the requested accessory building uh, use permit is consistent with the general plan. Um, again, I want to make sure that is probably the most important statement and zoning requirements in the zone. That's probably the most important, literally, the most important statement in this entire thing, which is located including the protection of adequate open animal areas on lots where animal keeping large animals is permitted. That doesn't just include the property. It also includes the neighboring properties, which is important. Um, the requested accessory building use permit will not have an adverse effect on the public convenience or general welfare of pers persons residing or working in the neighborhood thereof and will not adversely affect adjoining land uses, including runoff, draining impact, and architectural compatibility. That's exactly the same language that was used in the previous zoning document. It doesn't mean anything and has been treated as if it doesn't mean anything. So I would like to, I would like to have, because it becomes once again in the eye of the beholder. And so I think that that, I'd like to know, because that's really something that's, a, that's just a carryover from a very old um, piece of legislation um, that is something that is in terms of maybe a commercial zone. So I just don't think that that covers 
what needs to be covered. I would like it to be much more specific. Um, I would even like to go so far as, because for example, in the area I live in, there is no percolation whatsoever, one inch, one inch percolation. And so I think those are the kind of things that need to be looked at. If somebody, a neighbor, comes in and says, hey, one inch percolation, that person building that needs to address that issue. Um, I'm trying to take this out of the eye of the beholder, whatever council person sitting there. I want the council person to go, look, it says this right here. This is what I'm going to do. Um, and again, this existed before. Um, this is the way we've always done it. No, we are moving to a new era in which I believe we're trying to protect what we have. What, what, what we're trying to protect going back to 18.46 or whatever it is. Uh, lot coverage, you talked about that, thank you. Um, on the lot coverage page four, for me, that's kind of not clear. I'd like to see that graph, if possible, done a little bit more clearly because it kind of goes against the 40% lot coverage. And so it kind of conf it confuses me and, and, and in terms of just what we're trying to do because it looks like, well, all buildings 40%, and yet we've Throughout this, we stated that 40% is not the criteria. Um, preservation, um, primary animal keeping, one of the things I'd like to see is to protect open area, additional requirements for added accessory building. I'd kind of like to see some of those things listed. Uh, the architecture, um, when we talk about windows that exceeds 20 feet in length, includes doors and windows for articulation and functionality. What I'd like to see is how big the windows are supposed to be because, for example, if you have a building that's 20 feet long and the side is 12 feet high and you have two two by three windows, it actually doesn't do a whole hell of a lot. So I'd like to have some sort of criteria. So once again, somebody sitting in my seat 10 years from now is going to go, wow, I'm not going to use my opinion. I'm going to use what it says in this code. Um, I like all the stuff about exterior. Uh, the wall thing I thought was an excellent remark uh, on the mayor. I think he, that was perfect. I think in terms of the application fees, I think if you actually do and go through everything that you're requiring, which will require site visits and things, I actually think these fees are pretty reasonable. And in fact, I'm wondering if you can even cover these fees at $2,228 because it will take a lot of staff time to actually look at the impacts of some of these buildings per what we're requiring. Um, the questions, there's no need for a third category of accessory building. I don't have a question with that, that's fine. Um, the graduated setback requirements, large vehicle, uh, I think he said it perfectly. I think part of what we're trying to do is, is some, just the way it is, some properties you can have these and some properties you can't. One of the things, and I've heard the mayor say this many times, quite rightfully so, every lot in Norco is different. And so in one property, you may be able to have a, um, an accessory building of a certain size, and another building you simply can't do without impacting your neighbors, and I think that's an important uh, aspect. Case-by-case uh, -case consideration, I think one of the things that's happened prior to this is all of a sudden, what wasn't in the municipal code, opinion became the municipal code. That is a very non-transparent way to conduct business. The municipal code is something that was built on years of open meetings, and so I think it's important we remember that. Uh, accessory buildings should be exempt from having to be reviewed by the Planning Commission since it will meet the intent of the ordinance. I think any time we build one of these buildings, we have to make sure if it's within our code, it says it's within our code to protect the neighborhood. I think we need to make sure we have it looked at. Uh, Lada should answer that question. Again, another important line is relationship to the strategic plan. I'm almost done. I'm sorry. I apologize for this. Not really, but I do. Um, responsibility for accuracy, which is... Uh, 186804, number five, responsibility for accuracy. What this previously meant is that if you didn't tell the truth or didn't have your site plan perfect, there was no hearing, there was nothing. It was simply, boom, your application was revoked. I think what, and that has not been followed. What I think we need to do is we need at this point to clarify exactly what that means. If somebody comes in and for example, they say on their application they're not gonna do a certain kind of activity, and then in a discussion in front of council, suddenly they are talking about that activity. The debate isn't the activity, it's what is on the application. I think that we need to decide 
what we're going to do if we find that an application isn't complete at any, pro any way along the process, whether it's been to planning or whatever. I don't think this is very clear. Um, uh, the way this reads now, I mean, go, go ahead, John. I mean, oh, no, I was just going to say that actually I'm surprised I, I agree with you in the sense that the change, simply changing for back to shell doesn't accomplish that. Uh, right, may, uh, may and uh, shell mean essentially the same thing in the context of it's just a cause. If what you mean is that it shall result in the application being denied, then that's what it needs to say. Well, you know, I, and I, I get what you're saying. Unfortunately, I called another attorney this afternoon, and he said shell is very specific for. Uh, you know what? It, the, I don't care. I don't care that the the shell, name, shell only points to making it a cause. It shall be a cause. Except shell, per the definition in the municipal code, is mandatory. And all I'm saying, whatever you want to do, I think the council needs to decide that if something isn't accurate, we need to decide just what is the process we will go through to determine whether or not that person, do they just go back and redo it, but it has to be done in a transparent way, and it has to be done in a way that it's not unfair. Uh, I, I may or shall, it doesn't really matter to me, I think yeah, shall is, we I, just I, need I, a process. I agree with what you said. That's all, we just need a process. Uh, investigation of application for accessory building, the commission shall, that means mandatory, cause of an investigation. I want to make sure I know what that entails. What's the process? What What is the checklist that when the person goes out there, for example, if you have a flag lot, are they going to look at the top part of the flag? Because the impacts of a flag lot are much more, and you know, unfortunately, experience is a great teacher. Um, I, Robin said something earlier today where she said, boy, if I knew what I knew now, um, I just want to make sure that whoever goes out there, there's a checklist, and they know exactly what it is they're going to be looking for. Um, accessory building use permit the commission and council on appeal. Um, once again, I want to make sure that we are we're totally, we have like a checklist, we know what we're looking for. Um, you already answered that question. Uh, da, 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 da. The requested accessory building, page three of eight. Um, the requested accessory building use permit is consistent with the general plan once again. Consistent with the general plan. Consistent with the general plan. Uh, two, um, convenience or general welfare of, of persons residing in the neighborhood. That is 868.14.2. Again, I think that that kind of language needs to be clarified uh, in terms of runoff, drainage impacts, architectural compatibility. But more importantly, one of the instances that goes out is right now, it's an engineer's opinion. And in many, many cases, he went out with a drainage, with a, with a drain plan that's, that's 50, 60, 70 years old. He said, well, this is where the water runs. He's full of you know what. The truth of the matter is, is we have to make sure that whatever we do, we are making sure that this is happening. One of the things that's occurring right now that we did as a council, we decided that we weren't going to do um, concrete slabs. Well, we had a guy here who was very happy, very mad, but very happy with us because he got to put in his concrete slab. Well, he drained right through his neighbor's yard. He's going to lose his house because he's being sued for the fact that he, he literally didn't know how to drain off of his property. And that's one of the things I would like to protect people against. Um, prevent damage or prejudice again. All of these conditions of approval when it comes to what what do, what happens to the people next door. What are what are the damages? What are the impacts? Um, application size layout. We've already answered all that. Um, I like Berlin's maximum. Um, the revocation and expiration of accessory building use permit. Um, I think we need to clear up what is the process if we decide to revoke or expire permits and variances. One of the things in this process I discovered, and no offense to anybody, is we didn't know how to measure a building. And so I think that we need to make sure that we know what happens if a building is too high. I mean, for example, the way it stands right now, you could get a permit for a 14-foot high building, or at least the previous way, and the way it worked is, uh, is it 16 feet thin? Is it 18 feet? Is it 20 feet? Because once the building's up, 
It takes a lot of courage to actually do the right thing, but the problem is we don't know what the right thing is because it's not actually in our code. If it's in the state code, I think we need to list it. If your building is one foot higher than what you say it's supposed to be, and it's measured every time the same way every building in the city of Norco, the building, what happens? Is it torn down? Are you required to get a new permit? What is it that you're required to do? I just think those are things. I just think we need to really lay out what is the process in terms of how we determine exactly how an accessory building is is measured and allowed in our neighborhoods so that council after council after council is not is not literally stripping the neighbors of their civil rights. And that's all I have. Uh, oh, no, I have more. I'm sorry. I apologize. The application. One of the problems with the application before was it was pretty much never rewritten. It was like from 1992 or something. Um, filing fee is good. Uh, General site plan, one of the things I want to make sure that we do on a general site plan because per, you know, unless we want to change the municipal code, our site plan is what we always refer back to. That is the most important thing. So if you have a site plan that doesn't have, for example, the measurements of the house in front of it, that site plan per our code is not legal. You have to go back and do it. And so, I mean, and I'm not making it up, that's what it says in the code. Um, 40% lot coverage or did this. I just think a lot of this stuff that we're handing out to people, like maximum allowed lot coverage, I think some of these things need to be explained to make sure that people understand when they fill out this application, that this application, which by the way, up until recently, wasn't even given to the Planning Commission, means something. It's not something that we just kind of help them fill out after the fact. Um, Building uh, lot coverage, again, we talked about that. How do we check? That's one of the things that I discovered, is somebody can come in and say their lot is X number of square feet, but do we actually check it? I think we need to have a criteria how we do that. Building size, what's the square footage? How do we check that? Do we check it per the concrete slab, or do we check it to the interior of the walls? One of the things you discover about accessory buildings is they're actually bigger sometimes than what is actually approved, simply because the, the interiors. It's, it's interesting. How do we measure? We need to make sure we know how to do that. Accuracy. What determines accuracy? How do we do that so that we're fair to the applicant, but we're also making sure that they're doing, they're putting on their application what they say they're going to do. Um, in terms of the flat grade, I question the 4% grade or less. Um, Percolation. I think there needs to be requirements to make sure all those, this is a special privilege, this is not a right, the right belongs to the neighbors. Um, one of the things that came into question is how do we tell when somebody has uh, how much dirt on their property? Uh, it, it, no offense to anybody, but nobody, nobody seems to know um, actually what is and is not a, requires a grading permit. I know the company I brought out to look at stuff new, but what should have happened is a grading permit should have been required to be issued. But I don't that's beside the point, but the point is we need to determine what is it that will prompt that grading permit. Not an opinion, but if there's a truck and trailer load and there's nine of them, that probably requires a grading permit. Um, two feet. Uh, again, we need to make sure that everybody's uh, online. One of the things I want to look at are leech holes. Leech holes in the city of Norco in some areas simply do not work. Uh, for example, where I live, one of the things that used to happen is a leech line would go out and the ground is so hard and concrete it literally would back up into people's homes. That has to be listened to. That has to be listened to. We do not stand with our, 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 our people saying we listen to the neighbors and the neighbors says, Hey, dude, guess what? Your engineer is off. We have to make sure that people understand there's certain areas in Norco that literally the ground is like concrete. Um, and I don't know how, we just somehow have to make sure that we do that. How do you check it? How do you really confirm it? And how do you do it in such a way that it's not personal? It's just the system. Uh, again, how do you check? How do you check? How do you check? And then my, my final comment is animal keeping, animal keeping, animal keeping. I think that one of the things we have to bear in mind is not only how does one of these, these special buildings not only affect animal keeping on the lot, but animal keeping on the neighboring properties. 
I think that's something that we need to continually, continually address because as all of you know, uh, animal keeping is under siege and we're being told by an element in the city of Narco that animal keeping is on the way out where fools were always up for trying to protect it. Um, I think that's all I have to say. I think for the most part, I think that the committee did a really, really good job, but I think the next step is how do we make sure that we know how to check things and we have literally a list, just like this list, site plans, that we literally can go from step one to step two and from council to council to council, from staff member to staff member to staff member that is taken care of so that this is fairly and legally done. That's all I have to say, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much for indulging me. Thank you, Kevin. Chad Mayor, can I ask a question? Yes, Steve. Uh, Council Member Basha did not get, for accessory buildings that do not have a solid outlet, did you agree with that or not? Well, you know what my question was, I didn't know what a lattice thing was, but the, but the reality is, is that whether it's a lattice roof or not, in my opinion, if you have a 12 foot high wall and has a lattice roof, you still need to do something about that. I can only tell you from personal experience, these buildings are hugely impactful. And they, and they, one of the things that is in our municipal plan is you're not allowed to depress the property values of your neighbor. Now, if we want to change that, so be it. But don't ignore it anymore. So if that building is bigger than what it's supposed to be and it has a lattice roof, which by the way, if a building is that big, would they even allow a lattice roof anyway? And eventually that lattice roof would probably end up next door because of a Santa Ana wind, I would think. But I'm good, I mean. Uh, I thought this was only going to be a six or six month review of the uh, the ordinance we passed last in the spring, and uh, not a redoing of the whole thing that we spent all these this time on before that. But so be it. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this was to see how we were doing with it. You've only had six applications go through under this, and three are still sitting waiting uh, to go to uh, planning commission and their suggestions are there so uh, I'm only going to work on the suggestions because if, if from what uh, my colleagues said over here is perhaps we should have an ongoing review of this accessory buildings by the planning commission as part of one of your duties every meeting is to keep an ongoing review of this thing and bring it back because you see it closer than most of us, but that's my opinion on that. Uh, just like we have the opportunity to approve or disapprove of any planning commission move, uh, approvals, that's where that should be addressed. And if we're going to go through the whole thing, then again, that should be another ad hoc committee to do that. Uh, but I'm going to go back, uh, Steve, on the uh, I'm not to ask you questions. I, I, I still firmly believe that the three categories are important. And the reason I say that, it goes back to the fee situation. I know we have to cover cost, but it comes to a point where I look at a 600 square foot building, which is not that big. It's only similar to having a uh, you can put two big cars in there and some garage and stuff like that for that. It's a truck or a trailer, a small trailer. Uh, and, two, and July 1st, it was $813, and now it's $22.28. But the 2,000 square foot one, which is huge, and it's the same cost. Why didn't we graduate those? Just if we're going to, if people want to have these large buildings, then I think we need to, and you're going to tell me why we can't do it, then I know John. And so, I mean, okay, all right, I mean, John, how do we, I mean, let's face it, if we want to encourage the smaller type of structures than the larger structures, or discourage that, you just charge people more. That's normally why it works. That's why you pay more for rolls than you do for a shabby. Unfortunately, the Utah government can't charge more than what it costs you. So, to the extent that we can show that, that doing what we have to do with a large building expends more staff time, costs more, we can charge it. 
But that was just, that's, I think, is one of the things that I would, if we're going to do this and, and, and try to not have these big airport hangers, I think that's one of the ways you do that. Um, I'm still for the uh, graduated setbacks, by the way. And that's why that was done, yeah, like my previous comment. Um, yeah, I'm sorry it ends up in the middle. That's a way to discourage that, those big buildings. Uh, as far as the case-by-case -case consideration and the setbacks, Steve, and, and, and the rest of the guy, uh, some were approved prior to us doing the 40 log matter. This is our correction, and that's what we did this correction. So to me, I'm, I'm for keeping the setbacks. Uh, I already addressed the application fees. Um, I don't have a problem for those smaller ones. I do have a problem when it goes 14 feet high. They need to come see you for those. And the reason I say that is because the height. Um, you go up here this weekend to the tough shed, and I'll bet you you're going to find those buildings are any taller than 12 foot. I mean, that's just... Uh, and then, as far as the lattice work, I don't care if it's a lattice work, if it's, 100, if it's 120 square feet, but I'm kind of like with Kevin, more than a 14 foot high structure of the lattice roof, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to watch the wind blow it away, or maybe you got to stand? And so I, I don't, I would worry about the structure and the integrity, and that was something I would definitely want to have. Uh, to be approved. But I, I like a guy with a percola, so those who call those remember that goofy thing that was up off of Bandermolen? That that was I could see that just going through a to a committee in, in an ARC committee. But I do believe that all this needs to go to the ARC and uh, so that we have at least that kind of input on it. Um, but again, this is supposed to be a six-month review of this project, not the whole codes, and to see where we're at with it. Uh, so I'm going to go back, and I know I probably shouldn't be asking questions because John's going to go, Steve, how's this working the current, in, in, the, in the six months that we've had this? Has this been easier for the commission, harder for the commission, or what's it doing? Uh, it's, it's been easier for staff. I can't speak for the Planning Commission, but the result of that one meeting, it was easier for them to. Uh, they, would, they approved three of them with no discussion or questions, because they, they met all the criteria of the, of the application. So my, my assessment is it's easier all the way down. All right, so and then and now we'll go back to staff, you and Alma, uh, and that is, is it, let's put it this way, the residents that come up, and the applicants in this process, do they understand it better? Probably the most confusing thing is the graduated setback, and we just walk them through it, and they get it after we tell them about it. Is it easier than the 40% lot coverage rule? Yes. Because the bottom line, they have numbers to go with, and they know how far what they can do. Right. And I know PACAs were excluded. Do we have any problems? with the way this is written. I don't know if you've had, have you had anybody from the hills or specific plan or any of those spaces like that that have come underneath the new rules that have even submitted an application? Uh, we have had, I think we have one application in, in Noble Hills and and they provided everything that they needed to. And they got by with it? And they right. got by. Okay. And that's uh, not the it's the Durham Hill specific plan, not the other one, not the red. Okay, no, correct. Not the red All right, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Irwin? Yeah, I got one question, Steve, uh, on these applications. I, I come talk to you the other day about uh, some people that contacted me. They wanted to move their PACA. And, uh, Everything. So whatever will come of that deal, they were upset about the fees and having to put the building in the middle of the property and uh, and all of that. Did they go ahead and? Uh, they have not filed. 
They are not final paper. I had, since I turned it back over to you guys, I hadn't heard from them again. So everything. So maybe that'll discourage them from putting one of these big things up in the middle of the property. But uh, two things on this besides that restroom. Uh, the engineering and grading, I think, is very important because of the water runoff. And I, I do believe that it needs to be engineered so you don't uh, impact your neighbor with, the, with your floodwaters. Because I know up there where Cabin lives, and that area there coming off the hills above California, the water runs all the way down the hillside and, and impacts a lot of people. And another thing on the height of the buildings, if you've got a 14 foot wall and your property's low and you go in there and build a two foot pad up, all of a sudden that building's going up to 16 feet. Is there anything that can be done about that? If you put up a pad, re reduce the height of your wall or, or what? Because that just makes it more of a monster when you, when you have to raise the ground. Yeah, the, the way the code is written, the height of the building is measured two feet out from the walls of the building to prevent people from doing exactly that, building up a pad and then building up a building on top of it. So the, the height is actually taken two feet away from the building. Okay, so that, that's covered then. Yeah. All right. That's all I have. Thank you. Can I Thank you. Just to respond to that? Sure, go ahead. I know it's your question. Yeah, the problem is, is that uh, is that you build your property out four or five or six or seven feet, and so you build it up two feet. The engineer doesn't understand that, and so what you do is you know you just build it out five, six, seven, eight feet, and that's the problem with that. And so somehow, maybe prior to construction, there needs to be a way to address that issue because you have buildings that are really high in this town. And uh, I think that's the reason is they build the pads up. And I also think there needs to, you know, I'm not really saying that I want to change the codes. I just want to make sure we have procedures to measure. That's what I want. Procedures to measure. Robert. Steve, can you tell me what's going to happen with the information you're getting from council today and how this proceeds going forward? The what will end up happening is we'll process a, an amendment, zone code amendment, uh, and specific plan amendments for the specific plans if there's a majority that agree on, on the issues that are discussed tonight. So we've got the, the bulleted items in the staff report. Uh, there seems to be consensus that the, the bathroom needs to be changed from minimum to maximum. And so, depending on the, uh, what the majority of the council gets to tonight, the zone code amendment will address that. So will it go to planning first? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, I guess for me, I do, as far as the other category, and I think the mayor will speak to this a little bit too, and I think I mentioned it like, six months ago, when we talk about making the process so people can be honest, and if somebody in Norco wants to have a wood shop, they should be able to have a wood shop, and the way this is, if we don't keep that other there, we might be making people dishonest, and I certainly don't want to uh, have that, and, you know, I think the rest of it is fine, I think the intent, or what our intent was, is still being met. Um, with the setbacks and some of that, so I'm fine with those. Um, and on the accessory buildings with the not a solid roof, I was trying to figure out what that was, and I was thinking maybe chicken coops or something, so I guess the gazebo falls under that as well, but obviously depending on the size, I think Planning Commission should be looking at those as well, just for safety issues, so. Yeah, because 
Councilman Robinson, uh, architectural review? That's, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Just somebody looking at it. Okay. Um, but other than that, I think that's all I have for this evening. Catch up. Um, huh. <laughs> I, I just want to on the because the lattice and this goes back to no and, and I know I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it and, and the reason I'm saying is what I'm thinking and I just when Robin brought this up about dishonest people not that there be anybody but it's one of those things well I want a lattice so I just go to the ARC after it's built well guess what. Now I throw my permanent roof on. So those are things that we would have to, probably the ARC would have to check on to, or you would have to be stipulation on that. So I think that was, you just brought that up, you it's easy picks. Is that what you're referring to? I like to see those, like structures with a lattice roof? Yes. Is that a specific yeah. gazebo? Okay. Um, that should not be exempt. Should be reviewed. Okay. So let me kind of address Kevin's comments on heights of buildings and things like that. That you know what we learned was um, to me it's like finding the consistency and determining the height of the building. Um, and there's one school of thought that it's, you know, from slab up, you know, to ridge or eave. Um, and then the other is measuring from outside of the building for the state code. Um, and I guess to me it comes back to is that finished surface or is that finished grade? What, what determines that point of reference? And I think that's what we have to find. Where's the consistent point with all of this? And we talked earlier tonight about, you know, like with block walls. When you determine the height of the block wall, you take it from finished surface and not the finished grade. So wherever it's determined from, and if it's, like I said, the state code, it, it's just that we should have the consistency that we can show where we're going to take that height from and then communicate that to the applicant. Okay, we'll come in with a different set of drawings that says, yeah, my building's 14 foot high, but I'm building it up from finished grade two feet. And then all we end up is pointing figures at each other. But to me, it's the consistency. Um, going down this list, no need for the third uh, accessory building. Um, I, to me, I, I don't care if, if that category stays for another six months. Um, and if, if we haven't had any use of it, we could just go ahead and get rid of it. I have no heartburn either way on that. Uh, graduated setbacks are uh, fine. Um, on the case by case buildings on adjoining lots, um, to me that um, the setbacks that we have, the graduated setbacks should remain. And, and we, you know, we've always heard this counter argument of, you know, I can do whatever I want on my property, and if it, if people don't like it and they want animals, they can come tear down the accessory building I built. So what would happen in that case if I tore down my accessory building and lo and behold, I find that there's a brand new one five feet away from me. You know what I'm trying to say there? So to me, it's um, it should remain with the graduated setbacks. <coughs> Fees, I think we charge enough, so. Mm -hmm. um, on the tough sheds, the, the 240 square feet on, like when we have a, a 
horse stall with a roof. It's a 12 by 24, it's not non-permanent. Anything larger than that would get a permit, correct? So on the tough sheds, up, up to that footage, because this is where I get a little confused, you have four, you have 240 or 480 feet, 14 foot high. Um, if you remember discussions years ago with Jeff Ferry, and we talked about how you could just line up all these tough sheds on your property when we were first doing the first ordinance, and that those were kind of like you know, little 10 by 10s on skids. And I would think 480 feet, you know, you put, you're not putting that on a skid, that's going to be on a slab. That I think the planning commission should look at that. If it's 240, if it's under that that threshold we use for horse stalls, um, that that footage could be exempt. I, I don't have much of a problem with that because we allow that same footage for a horse animal keeping. So then, it, it, but with all of that, to me it still comes back to what I, my questions I was asking earlier, it's on use. And that's where I think that I have the, the hardest point with is that I have to fudge my application and call it large vehicle parking if I wanted to have a, a, a workshop in there. Or the situations that could exist that what if I sell my RV? And can I use all of it for a workshop? You know, it's it's the use part that bothered me, and that was what bothered me the, when we had the second reading on this the first time. And the reason I voted no was not that I have a problem with any of this, other than I don't. My feeling is that would didn't really communicate use that well. And then we're forcing other situations that I don't want to see it manipulated. And that I can just approach this in a, a straightforward manner. Is that clear? Because it's a hard, it took me a long time to get it. Yeah. And well, it's yeah. hard to describe it. Use has always been problem because mm -hmm. the in a situation if you build an RV uh, parking structure and sell the house and the new people don't have an RV do they have to leave it set empty so the way it was interpreted is that as long as they're doing a residential use with it then they're not in violation of the municipal code um, but if they start doing something commercial in it, that's Absolutely, they, right. Right, no. and, and I don't have a problem with that. It's just, you know, I, I want to know it's okay and I don't have to fudge on my application. So those are some of my concerns. But I think overall it, it's, it's working out much better. There's, it's got to tune it up in a few points. But do we need to make a, if there isn't any more conversation, do we need to make a recommendation, go back to the Planning Commission to review this, or is it go without saying? Uh, I mean, it kind of depends on the council. Uh, given the discussion, you might want to look at a draft before okay. you send it back to the Planning Commission. Uh, at least that way Steve has some idea, yeah, that is that is in fact what we meant. Or maybe there are issues that, in the language that say, well, that's let's tweak that a little bit before we send it back. But recognizing that you're not blessing it because if I commission will look at it, you're going to have another public hearing. But at least there's some certainty. You okay with that, Kevin? Yeah. And, uh, I, Mr. I think you said it perfectly here. Uh, all I really want is just make sure it's clear. What are the criteria? What is it? I think the document's fine. We just need to, I think you said it perfectly. Okay. Okay. Yes, I am. And as long as, and Kevin rattled off a bunch of the muni codes of the 18th section about that, I, and I think to address that, and, and that's why 
if we go back to the Planning Commission with each section and let them take the time to pick it apart and go through each one of these areas and see where we're at, see if everything is still applicable and feasible for what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish here. And I think the, the Planning Commission is the right way, the right place to do it. Robert? No, that's fine. Okay. Just to be clear. Sure, Andy. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I just want to get an understanding of the specific changes that the city council is asking to be made to the code uh, because I still I, I don't have those. Maybe still have something different. What are the specific changes that is being recommended to be made to the code as it exists under 18.68? for this accessory uh, building to use permit. So, it, Mr. Mayor, if, if, go ahead. Uh, I'll just go down the list of how everybody kind of did their straw vote tonight. Um, we're keeping the third category. The graduated setback is sustained. Uh, no case-by-case -case consideration. We're sticking with the, the setback requirement. Uh, the application fees stays the same. Um, the 240 square foot uh, kit buildings, like a tough shed, those would be exempt from going to planning commission, but anything larger than that would still go to planning commission. Uh, the Sounds like the, con the consistent answer for buildings with a lattice roof are going to be processed just as they would, whether it's a solid roof or not. Unless that, that's kind of the consensus I heard. I, I so, with that, there's only one change here. It's the bathroom. It's maximum. Okay, the bathroom and the 240 square foot. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure that. That's what we're changing. But, but also, was, there was some language clarifications. Oh. Uh, there was a multiple language clarifications. I mean, yeah, well, the, the the measuring of height issue. Um, by the way, one of the documents that you don't have with you tonight is the uh, uh, the city council adopted as part of this was uh, administrative policies and procedures, which actually shows the how how staff deals with evaluating of all of these criteria or all these requirements on a step-by-step -step basis. Uh, that is not attached to your staff report tonight. So um, to me, if we are going to clarify how the height of the building is measured, um, that is a document where that would be, uh, would be specified. Um, I don't know if it's currently specified in that document or not. I mean, one of the things that I asked, if we we're going to notify people, and I just like to know that when they walk in there, they know, okay, well, this is what, this is what, um, what power I have to affect change or or whatever, because otherwise, why notify anybody? There's several things here that, I don't know, mainly just, for me, it's just, it may not be in the code, it may just be, let's make sure things are clear. Like, for example, what what is the procedure if a application is found to be in error? Does it simply, if it's if the site plan is complete, is it just, oh, hey, fill out the site plan? But if it's found that they're going to be you know, they admit in an open session that they're going to be doing a use that they said they wouldn't be doing, which has happened. What happens then? Do everything come to a sudden stop? What happens? Do you just, okay, we address it. We're sorry that you went through planning commission. You're, you are an error. Or what does that mean? Does our application just go back to step, step one? Or does it, I mean, how do you legally handle that? That's the kind of stuff I, I would like to make sure. Unfortunately, I mean, 
Joe Turk raises an interesting issue. That the, the difficulty is defining not only what what you do, but how you define what is not accurate. I mean, are, would, for example, somebody that uh, is in, I'm making this up, an inch off on measuring their sight, uh, that's literally not accurate, but is that something which would result in, sorry, you're done, go back. And that one of the reasons why the language was originally right away, I think, was that it allowed the planning commission and the city council the discretion to say, yeah, that's a significant problem, you're done, uh, or that's de minimis and it doesn't have any effect. But it's a hard question. Yeah, I mean, mainly what it is is that they don't put down a use because they know that that use may not allow them to build that building. I'm going to build toys when, in point of fact, you're going to work on motorcycles and you're going to use a welder. So you put down, I'm not going to use a welder. And that's a significant piece. And then the other thing is we just need to decide what is a site plan. Does a site plan, because I looked at, as you know, I looked at every single accessory building that was approved from 2010 to today. Every site plan practically was different. What What is it that we want in our site plan? I mean, do you want a site plan or the house? You don't have the measurements. Well, the code said you gotta have them. So, this... But is there any specific change we want to make to the code? Like, Berwyn's got the bathroom as a maximum. All this other is going to come under policy process, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it won't even find its way in there. We just know, okay, this is how we do it. So are we clear then, Steve, on what would change? Like on the tough shed, that would change, correct? And, and the one thing I'm left out is, is the noticing requirement. We change it to the. Right. Uh, not noticing. Line. Anything else? Steve? Yeah. Uh, oh gosh. Well, we don't really make a kind of motion do you want to make on this then? Don't, uh, there's no motion. I just, yeah, there's no recommendation. Uh, and just come back to you in a draft. I mean, I guess, frankly, given the changes we've just talked about, do you think it's necessary to have the draft come back or just go to planning? I'd like to see the draft come back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you have your recommendation? Yes. Okay. Moving on smartly, we go to uh, Public hearings, item 6A. Chad? See the exciting ones for last. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item is brought up before uh, Council for their approval. Um, as you know, we uh, aggressively are trying to do as many uh, storm drain projects in the city as we can using uh, very generous funds provided by the Flood Control District. Uh, we currently have 11 uh, minor projects um, in, that are being under, currently going to be under design or some are under construction right now, being completed for this fiscal year. Uh, we also have some uh, Category 1 uh, major projects. Usually those major projects that are defined as anything over 36 inch or larger um, are built uh, and designed directly by the uh, Anything smaller than that, they're free. They, they're happy to have us design that. We've been very successful in that program, and, and they've actually touted us uh, to other agencies that how well we do um, in using their money and getting these projects done. Uh, however, it doesn't uh, uh, doesn't mean we don't want to go bigger and better. Um, and we've taken upon ourselves to look at certain projects that are Category 1 projects that we think are important to get done, and we'd like to take on um, using our consultants. And in this case, we uh, looked at the S2 project, uh, which is on, uh, you have it in your map, it's on 2nd Street, uh, between Temescal and uh, Corona Avenue. Uh, we feel it's a project the handle. It's a larger pipe, but it's just really designing it. And this is allowed to be done specifically to meet the requirements for flood controls design because they will maintain it after it's completed. So 
So it's a little more rigid in uh, how we are going to design it uh, versus the smaller projects. We have a little more leeway of how we want to have design materials, etc., um, which is not an issue for us. Um, in fact, the flood control will do um, part of the review process in the plans to make sure they meet their standards. But we will ultimately put the project out to bid. We will um, uh, do some of the inspections, etc., uh, to make sure that it gets done. And, and we're not necessarily waiting, which we do on, on many of these projects, is really to when they have time and staff be able to do any of these designs. So they're not all small projects. So uh, what we have before you is, is uh, threefold, is, is approve the, um, the proposals that were submitted by uh, the, the two agencies uh, and approve the, the lowest proposal, which was from Armstrong and Brooks. Uh, they actually, uh, previous week, approved uh, some other projects that they're going to design for us for storm, uh, or storm water drain projects. So this is another one we're adding onto their plate. Um, to design, it is intended to get done. That's why at the end of the year, at least for design, so we can get it under bid, uh, bid uh, in the beginning part of this next year. Uh, and then also approve the contract with KWC, uh, so if, if you accept their proposal. And then also approve the resolution, which uh, adds this project to our CIP um, funds uh, as far as an acceptable project that will um, allocate funds for that project, that which will eventually come from uh, flood control and with where our expenditures will come out of those, those same funds. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions of staff? Okay. This is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Does the clerk have any cards on the matter? No, sir, I do not. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing and bring it back to council for any uh, further discussion. Is that bad, even? No, not Berwin? No, Robin. Robin? Just real quick, Chad. So since we're kind of stepping out on this and taking on a bigger project, if this goes well, do you see in your mind that we'll be able to get more of these done and kind of fast track some of the projects for Norco? Yes, we actually have other projects we want to take on, but we're actually limited in that blood control needs to finish a couple projects that some of the ones we wanted to lead into that. Otherwise, I'd probably have one or two more in front of you also. Well, thank you for uh, going out and working on this. Kevin? Kevin? You're doing good. Move to approve. Second. You're sneaking up on me. Okay, we have a motion from Councilmember Hanna and a second from Councilmember Grunmeyer to accept bid submitted um, and award a contract to, if I'm reading this correctly, Armstrong and Brooks Consulting Engineers mm -hmm. in the amount of 35750 and to adopt resolution 2017-63 amending the fiscal year 2018-2020 capital improvement project budget storm drain fund to include Norco MDP Line S2 storm drain project. Correct. Thank you. You know, you guys should have said uh, that. Or, Roll call. This is yeah. why we have you. Oh, okay. That's what I did. Um, Roll call. Council members Bash? Yes. Grunmeyer? Yes. Hannah? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hoffman? Yes. And Mayor Newton? Yes. Motion passed 5 0. Thank you. Okay, we'll move into City Council, City Manager, Staff Communications. Kevin? One thing where I know that next council meeting, Chad, you're going to be talking about Crestview, correct? Um, I had a long conversation with John Tavoloni about maybe fast tracking the Crestview um, the situation. And I know Andy's concerned we don't want to overstep our bounds, but John did say that we could go meet with him, bring a map. He would bring John Fields and he would support fast tracking that project. He said there's plenty of money. The problem is, of course, buying the land, but I, I think it might be advisable to go and see them before our meeting so we may have some information for them next time we come in. And I know you have concerns. Well, we, we might have talked about scheduling perhaps a joint meeting so that John Tavloni and his staff can be with us along with floor control district staff. So do you think we can do that before? Or, I mean, it's, a, it's a, you well, manage it the way you see fit. I was trying to schedule that meeting as, as soon as we can get it scheduled. I think he's already, we've already tried to contact more control. Yeah, I made inquiries um, with uh, uh, Jason Uly, but he's on vacation until Friday, but I'm going to continue to try to. If possible, I'd love, if possible, if I'm available, I'd love to be at that meeting just to see what's going on. 
And John said he would like to be there too. Yeah, so. Okay. 10. Okay. Okay. Hey Chad, I just I know you got a streets and trails meeting. Was it Monday? How was how was our river drive coming? I, I know you're working on it. Just you know, status on that. Uh, we didn't bring that up for a topic for discussion at this time because we're staff's not prepared to really have a meaningful discussion about what if anything would be done to to do any amendments on that area. Okay. We're so planning to bring it maybe the next discussion. All right. So and what's our current status on it? Just. Uh, it's still um, being worked on, it's, uh, but they've, we've, they've gone through and uh, impacted a couple different times and we're still reviewing it and kind of highlighting areas they need to, to go back and work on. Okay, so we're still it's pretty close to being really complete as far as um, what we intended them to do. And then my other issue, and I don't know if, if the mayor's going to bring it up, uh, I don't think it's, it's in our jurisdiction, but maybe we need to talk to uh, uh, Rickwa is that along River Road there, or Eastvale, you know, maybe it's Eastvale's, uh, the River Road Bridge on the other side, uh, we're getting, it's becoming a beach when during the warm weathers for those people. I don't know what, is that Rickless? No, that's not Rickless jurisdiction. That's Eastvale's jurisdiction? Yeah, they, they have a, the, the bridge is, is half of its county. Uh, a quarter of it's Eastvale and a quarter of it's Norco. So the second beach? Yeah, it's the second beach. It's just down there. You know the area I'm talking about? Sure. Maybe we need to get a hold of our Eastvale compadres. Mm -hmm. It's probably either Army Corps or it's uh, potentially could be Orange County Water District, depending on what area part down they own. I'm not sure the ownership of the area down there as far as who owns it, so we have, to, we have to look into it. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if anybody else, if he's going to take his concern or anybody knows what's going on. Yeah, I'm not sure. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Brown? Yeah. Brown? Yes. Uh, Chad, I noticed uh, that the weeds and grass and stuff are starting to grow up in these uh, flood control channels. Can you contact flood control about cleaning them out before we get a new... Uh, Ship with mosquitoes in here, and I'll talk to Vector too. I know they're here. Vector's here every day, though, working somewhere in town. You have a particular area that you notice them occurring? Uh, no, I have to go back and look because I drive by all of them at least once or twice a week. It'd be helpful because they're gonna ask where, and I don't want to say all the channels. Yeah, between between fourth and fifth on there, it's it's getting up there pretty tall. And then the one on uh, uh, Corona between uh, seventh and or yeah, between seventh and sixth, is starting to grow up again. Thank you. I just have a couple. Uh, following up with Ted on, on the River Road Bridge, basically it's um, getting weekend traffic parking down there in that area and using the river. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the question is. Though. Is we're trying to accommodate the parking? No. We want to nip this in the bud so that whether it's signage or gates or whatever, but we don't need the river road bridge area, okay, where you can pull off the road, park your car and walk down and enjoy the beach. Um, I mean, I mean, I, I can certainly forward your concerns to Eastvale and the ages we determine about jurisdiction in that area. Um, but it's not something directly that we can mitigate because it's not our—it's not within our city jurisdiction on that side. Okay, let's look at our side then. Okay, also. Okay. Um, Diane. Yeah, take knowledge for it. I want to thank you for the new binders. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's—they're big enough where we can like turn and not have to flip things. <laughs> and the other one was uh, 
I guess this is an Andy thing. Um, it's a policy code enforcement that what, what brought this up is that we have a code case comes up and then there's a current building permit that was issued okay before the code case that and we're and we're not getting response from the code case that we should be able to be able to put a stop work notice on that project and I, and don't give me that look and the, uh, the reverse of that is that if if there's a code case and someone comes in to make the application for a permit that um, we shouldn't allow a building permit to the code cases satisfied it no you don't want to hear this but the difficulty I don't. with that is that uh, particularly with building permits they're not discretionary they're ministerial uh, and that we will incur liability to that individual if we don't issue the building permit. He meets all the provisions of the code related to the building. There has to be some nexus, or we we just incur some potential liability. I, and I just I don't know. No, I, I just have I, a hard I, time I, with no. that. You can go ahead. And Violate the codes, but you can still rock along and build well, stuff. The, you know, the difficulty uh, is that uh, what we, what you said, is our assumption that they're violating the code. They presumably don't agree with that, and so there's a process to determine whether they, in fact, if they in fact violated the code, then at least we have an argument, as opposed to us simply citing. That's not the same. Having an ongoing code case isn't the same thing as a determination that they've actually violated the code. That's, that creates some due process issues. Uh, but what we do in... Mike's on, Mike's on. Yes. What, what, what we do in real life is essentially what you're saying, saying, hey, look, you know, we're not going to do this unless you uh, clean up your stuff. I mean, that, that's the attitude that the city, and virtually every city, but the city in particular is always has. Uh, if we get pressed on it, then we have to take a look at the next one. All right, well, I'm going to rethink this issue. <laughs> this is on the Andy, storage of the tax. I know, Andy. Yeah, I know. This is on the issue of the taxi cabs being stored. Lieutenant. Yes, I appreciate the moment of silence we have for the victims of the Las Vegas incident. We know that there were victims from all walks of life, and two were included from my very own Sheriff's Department. So I'd like to not acknowledge Deputy Jason McMillian. He was shot in the chest. He is currently in critical condition at a Las Vegas area hospital. The other uh, deputy that was shot was a correctional deputy. He has since been treated and released for his injuries, so I'd just like to keep them in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Chief. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have one tonight uh, <clears throat> working with Andy in, in securing funds. We were able to expand the public access defibrillation program in the city over this last month. Uh, previously, we had four defibrillators in the city in our city facilities. Now we have nine, and they're located at City Hall, the Senior Center, Riley's Gym, Nelly River Hall, Ingalls, uh, the Public Works offsite offices, Parks and Rec's offsite, and Animal Control. And our last, which will be uh, sometime in November, will be the Scout House Week people once we train the employees there. So we've trained about 45 employees this year from the city in uh, first aid, CPR, and defibrillation. But these are in public locations, so the layperson can utilize them as well. Uh, and thanks to Brian Staff Hank for installing the boxes and getting the signs up around town. I appreciate it. Good job. Gina. Money in the bank. Good. Brian? Just, just a reminder that the Horse Affairs this weekend for the public, uh, Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, Friday and Saturday is from 9 to 11, and then Sunday from uh, 9 to 8 p.m. Let everybody come up. They're really doing a good job on it. What do we have on the Steve? No. Chad? I'm just doing it. just a big council as far as the. Um, Improvements to the uh, street lights or not street lights, the signals at uh, Fifth and Hammer. They have put up the um, uh, lights themselves, uh, but they're bagged. Uh, we're still waiting for the um, control cabinet and uh, 
and software to show up. It's just delayed on that, so we anticipate that should be up and running before the end of this month. And also we did receive the equipment uh, related to the um, pedestrian cross rocks and feedback signs that were put in front of the schools. So we intend to have those up before the end of the month. Thank you. Thank you. Diane? It's been a pleasure being here with you tonight. Thank you very much for letting me join in the fun. Take my phone. Andy. Just one earlier, she wasn't a paid employee. That's right. One of the quick places I have all the council members here is that uh, the, the owner of the Air Grange property has submit, submitted an application to develop the property. Um, we are still going to determine what process that application needs to follow. Good. Anything else? Thank you. We're adjourned.